בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים. We're back here on our Wednesday night, uh, Stump the Rabbi issue, where after a little bit of delay Torah, you guys, Bezat Hashem, will ask some questions, the Kadosh Baruch will give us the answers, we'll continue learning, continue growing. Uh, tonight's shiur will be for Ilui Nishmat, uh, Ezra Ben Miriam, and uh, also for a Le'avdi Le'refua Shlema, for Rabbanit Sarah Bat Anat, Rav Efraim Ben Shulamit, Pnina Bat Shulamit, Ilani Bat Pnina, uh, Tinoket Bat uh, Sarah, uh, Levana Bat Sarah, David Ben Esriya, Doris Bat Jora, Itro Ben Avraham, Talia Bat Sarah, Orit uh, Bat Ilana, and uh, also for Atzlacha Raba for uh, Marsha Bat Julie, Ayla Bat Marsha, Samuel Ben Marsha, Sefas Ben Marsha, uh, Louis Ben Marsha, Shaul Ben Farzane, Ruben Chaim Ben Pala Parel, uh, also for Zivug Agun, uh, Itro Ben Avraham, Oshri Ben Doris, Gabi Ben Doris, Elad Ben Doris, David Ben Asriya, Joshua Ben Noach, Alex Ben Noach, and Netanel Yosef Ben Avraham, and also for Zivug Agun, and for all of the wonderful people that continue to contribute, continue to uh, partner with us, to do all the good things that Baruch Hashem, our organization, Be'ezrat Hashem, is doing. Um, now, a couple of things, a couple of small updates. First, I have two piles of uh, papers with me. Two things we'll, uh, Be'ezrat Hashem, uh, discuss tonight. The first one is uh, the first pile of papers, which is, uh, Baruch Hashem, several dozen uh, of you that have uh, gone on the uh, website bhtorah.org, our uh, new site for the uh, new campaign, uh, to get yourselves one box of these uh, amazing CDs and DVD uh, that we discussed just the other day, uh, the Tikkun Abrit uh, lectures and uh, in audio, and also the uh, Hashem Took Back His Millions uh, movie. Uh, one of these boxes, it's about $170 value, we're sending to a bunch of people that have already signed up and there's still much more left for any of you that have not signed up if you're located in the united states please go to bhtorah.org b as in boy h as in harry uh torah t-o-r-a-h dot org and uh, sign up and we'll send you a uh, brand new box of these uh cds 25 double cds They'll be able to uh, distribute in your community. The only thing that we ask you to do is to distribute them right away uh, and not uh, to delay, not to keep them in your purse, not to uh, keep them in uh, just in case. Give them out as soon as possible. That's in essence the whole point. So a, uh, for the first pile of papers, for the first bunch of people that have signed up, about three or four dozen of you uh, that have actually already signed up, Chazakim uh, Ubuchim, Ashrechem Ve'ashrechelkechem. Chazakim uh, and that you're taking the initiative to uh, to help Am Israel by uh, distributing these CDs. All you know, although it may seem like not a big deal, it's free. Why not? Uh, why not take stuff for free? Uh, the reality is that the Satan will always fight Kiruv because that's how he steal his soldiers. Uh, so when people go out there and they uh, they make the sacrifice, they know that they're gonna uh, you know have to. Uh, fight the Yetzirah, not just to uh, place the order, uh, but also to uh, uh, to go and uh, give it to people in their hands, give it in the community, and so on. Uh, they know that they're gonna they're taking on a war, but at the same token, they're taking on uh, the wars of Hashem, uh, just like Pinchas uh, ben Elazar ben Aaron Cohen in this week's parasha. Kadosh Baruch Hu says that Pinchas ben Elazar ben Aaron Cohen eshivet chamati mi'al bnei Yisrael beken oed kinati betocham. Hashem says to Moshe Rabbeinu in this week's parashat Pinchas, Hashem said to Moshe, Pinchas, son of Elazar, son of Aaron, the Kohen, turn my wrath, turn back my wrath from upon the children of Israel, where he zealously avenged my vengeance among them, so I did not consume the children of Israel in my vengeance. Here, Rabotai Yekarim, HaKadosh Baruch Hu Bechvodo Ube'atzmo tells us that if it was not for Pinchas and his zealousness to fight the wars of Hashem, the war for the honor of Hashem, Hashem would have destroyed all of Am Yisrael, Chash And it's not because we were already located 
in uh, Eretz Yisrael, like some idiots are telling people today, oh no, only if you sin inside Eretz Yisrael is, uh, is Hashem actually kill people and punish them. That's what nonsense. This, they're not in Eretz Yisrael, they're in a desert. And Akadosh Baruch Hu saw that Am Yisrael is sinning, they're, they're uh, being uh, intimate with, uh, with non-Jewish women, they're uh, serving idols, they're doing all types of things that are against the Torah, and Akadosh Baruch Hu just started killing people. 24,000 people died in, in a matter of minutes just during the, that, this week's parasha. Last week there was also several thousand, and, and obviously everybody that's been reading the weekly Torah portion and just simply knows how to read sees that HaKadosh Baruch Hu does reward and punish. But at the same token, we also see that Pinchas, for his zealousness, for his zealousness, he is the one that brought Shalom. He is the one that brought Shalom because to tell people that they're doing something wrong is how you bring Shalom, how you bring peace. Because otherwise, if their version of what Hashem's will is, is not the same as what Hashem's will is, they think that uh, to fulfill Hashem's will means they could do whatever they want. They could have gay parades. They could uh, promote uh, all types of heretical thoughts. They could do. Uh, they could steal. They could act uh, morally righteous only according to their own opinions, just like uh, the Hitler Imachimo and Himmler and uh, Eichmann and all of the Nazis from the World War II. They all thought that they're morally correct, just like all heretics think that they're morally correct. Kadosh Baruch Hu says, if your morals are based on your own opinion or your gangster friends or the losers that you surround yourself with, you are not in line with Kadosh Baruch Hu and I will at some point punish you. I will at some point punish you. And that's why when someone warns people, warns people about this, that's what bringing shalom means. That's what achdut is. Unity is not by accepting everybody as they are. That's not unity. That is uh, chaos that is heretical that is complete foolishness accepting people for who and what they are without telling them that they're doing something wrong that's for their benefit that is being a murderer because if you know that someone is going against the shem and they perhaps either don't know or they don't know the ramifications of it and you're the one that's telling them something that's going to bring peace it's going to bring peace between them and hashem that's going to be bring peace into the world itself but of course this is the dirty work that a lot of people not only don't want to do, but also go against. Why? Because the Satan, Satan has a lot of soldiers and he convinces people that if they simply just like everyone and act like everyone and so on, that's the way to, to create unity. So the question is, what do the Gdole Adon uh, think? What do the biggest rabbis in the world think? I mean, they're not necessarily all doing lectures on the uh, uh, I mean, on the internet, and, and even more so, you see that sometimes you have people that are making, a, you know, have videos on the internet are saying things that are contrary to uh, to what we're saying in our lectures for the last several years. Baruch Hashem, thousands of lectures. So you have yourself a box full of lectures that we're giving out for free. You have several lectures, Baruch Hashem, every single week that we're doing live and uh, and all types of video clips and so on. Who is behind this? Who is does anybody support it? Because of course, if you talk to the naysayers, they're gonna say that our opinion is a independent opinion. None of the big rabbis think like us. None of the big rabbis talk to us. Everybody hates us. We're frowned upon and so on and so forth. But can somebody prove this in black and white? Can someone prove this in black and white? Because they can say something and it could be true and they can say something could not be true. We already proved that the naysayers are not only heretical, but they're also liars. But the question is, who is supporting? Now we have Baruch Hashem on our website and our YouTube channels, many videos, videos from big rabbis that have supported us, uh, you know, publicly. And this is not a common thing for anyone that will look up the websites of some of these uh, uh, other rabbis, some uh, great rabbis. And obviously, some of the Leavdil heretics that we talk, we speak against on a regular basis, you're not going to usually see the support videos or letters by anybody, simply because that's not a common thing. Sometimes you'll see somebody writing a letter for uh, what's called an askama for a book and things like that, but rarely are there videos done uh, for uh, one rabbi for another, simply because people don't want to put their reputation on the line unless they can vouch for their work. So. 
in my hand, in my hand right now, I have the second pile of papers. And this is not the complete pile. This is just something that's fresh, fresh off the press, fresh off the press. And I love to uh, make sure that everyone always sees things for what they are. Not because I think that the naysayers will ever change. Because, of course, they'll always have some other lie to make up or some other type of excuse and, and, and so on. But the reality is, is that we want all of the people that are supporting, all of the people that are learning with us, to at the very least always have the confidence that this is Da Torah. This is not Da Yaron. This is not the opinion of Yaron Uven. This is not the opinion of uh, Rav Ephraim. This is not the opinion of a unique cult, but this is the dot of the Torah, everything that we teach. Now, Baruch Hashem, anyone that knows anything about Chachamim, Chachamim don't just write letters for no reason. Chachamim don't just make videos for no reason. Unless they verify and they check every little thing, they simply don't put their names on it. That we, you know, sometimes there have been some Chachamim, that will encounter will mean and say, listen, why don't you come look at our work and then see if you could uh, uh, support what we do and so on. And some people would say, listen, I simply don't have the time. I don't have the time to check everything that you do. And therefore, I simply uh, can't just vouch for something blindly because of all of the uh, mistakes that are out there in the world today. And that's perfectly fine. So which means that if you're going to talk to a, uh, a, a somebody and you're going to ask for support, they have to obviously double check what they're doing. This is something that uh, every Baal uh, Da'a, any person with a little bit of brain, knows, or at the very least learned in the last year, with all of these uh, conspiracy videos that you see about coronavirus and the vaccine and so on, what is the first common denominator that all of the videos and articles have in common? What is the common denominator? The first thing is, they start with the credentials of who is talking. The credentials. This is Dr. Such and such, he has done such and such, he has been around for X amount of time, he knows everything, he did this, he did that, da, 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 da. and they give you the credentials for the first 15 minutes of a 20 minute video. That's generally how it is in the world. People want to know, you know, who supports you, who backs you. I remember when I was on Wall Street, one of the things that the clients enjoyed is the fact that I had nine different security licenses, which is very uncommon. Most people have one two maybe three licenses i had nine different securities licenses each requiring a very lengthy th test and so on but the point is i was certified across the industry in bonds and options and stocks and so on and so forth and also had a lot of other rewards that we got in the industry and people that knew that they're dealing with somebody that at the, at the very least is trying to be the best it's trying to be the best not just somebody that's just paying a uh, hundred dollars to get some type of certificate in the mail so in the rabbinical world, it's much more difficult. And the reason why is because it's not about just what test you passed, but it's about show us your stuff. What are you saying? What are you writing? And Baruch Hashem, we've done a lot of work that people can watch on the internet and so on. And uh, we also, Baruch Hashem, are now in the process of publishing my first book, and it's going to be in Hebrew. Uh, we did it in Hebrew for a couple of major reasons. Number one, because the overwhelming majority of my work over the last seven years has been in English and it's time for us to uh, help the Hebrew speaking market uh, you know as much as what we're doing in the English speaking market so the book is in Hebrew uh, Hashem eventually we'll, we'll translate it to English too that shouldn't be too difficult but the second thing is is because we wanted the Gdole Ado, we wanted the big rabbis we wanted the big Chachamim to read it themselves and Simply decide, is this da Torah? Is this da Torah? Because you, you know, because if you say, listen, I have a uh, letter from uh, such and such rabbi on my English book, all of the naysayers will say, yeah, but this rabbi doesn't really know what you're saying because it's English and he doesn't speak English. Like everybody assumes that the, the wisest men on the planet are stupid. It's, it's really silly. But nonetheless, Rabotei Kalim. Here we have a bunch of different letters from some of the greatest rabbis that I know, some of the greatest rabbis in the world. Now we have one letter that uh, several support letters that we've gotten already over the years from Arab Gidon ben Moshe. Arab Gidon ben Moshe, for anyone who doesn't know, is one of the head rabbis in Jerusalem. Okay, he's in the uh, Bed Din of Jerusalem. A Jerusalem Bed Din is also one of the main Talmidim of uh, Arab uh, Tzion Abba Shaul, Abba Shalom. 
Rav Tzion Abashul had uh, three or four main Talmidim, and uh, and uh, Rav Gidon Ben Moshe is not only one of them, one of those main ones, but uh, even more so, he's actually one of those that actually wrote the books, co-wrote the books, uh, the book of Rav Tzion Abashul. So he has written a public support letter for our organization, for the work that we do, for the Torah that we teach, and, our, and Baruch Hashem also for the book. He's uh, made a video for us. For anyone that wants to go to our website or the YouTube page, you just type in uh, Rabbi Gidon Ben Moshe, and you'll see Rabbi Gidon make a video uh, publicly supporting us, but also, again, continuous support. Not just support in the past, but support right now. We just got a recent letter of Baruch Hashem from him, supporting what we're doing we also have one of the uh one of the serious tell me one of the serious tell me in bnei brak uh arav uh, yosef abadi the uh from the rosh rosh of, uh, of um oil yosef uh also a uh, dayan Talmid Chacham, wrote and made a video for us wrote a book also uh, supporting the the new book Baruch Hashem, and this is another one we have a uh, Rav Yosef Chaim Mizrahi, which is a Dayan in Eretz Yisrael, who's made several videos to support us, continues to support of all of our work, also uh, gave us an askama for the book. Our own very, very dear Rabbi Yosef Mizrahi from, uh, from New York wrote us a uh, uh, askama, a very beautiful one, heartwarming one, that uh, Baruch Hashem, he continues to support everything that we do. And uh, we, Baruch Hashem, do uh, reciprocate the same, of course. Uh, Rav Chaim Kachlon. This is one of the Talmidei Chachamim in Netanya. Uh, it's uh, Rav uh, Ephraim's uh, father. He's also a uh, uh, in a, um, a Megid Shiur in uh, Yeshiva in in, uh, in uh, Maori Israel. It's a Yeshiva in uh, in um, in Netanya. He's also built the Yeshiva. A uh, very serious Talmid Chacham. He actually wrote a not just an askama, but uh, also a uh, literally an entire. Uh, synopsis of the book uh with each and every single section and who it's relevant to and so on really really beautiful stuff our own very dear friend this is one of the tzaddikim one of the uh, biggest tzaddikim that i uh, personally know of shlomo bar kochba of shlomo bar kochba is uh not a uh known uh on youtube or uh, or, or in that case but uh, anyone that is in uh eretz israel in yerushalayim in arnof uh, knows the uh, who Rav uh, Bar Kochba is. He is uh, not only a Baal Chesed and a big Talmid Chacham. He wrote a, uh, a couple of books. Baruch Hashem also brought uh, the uh, the the Rabbi of the Chida, Rav Mizrahi, the Rabbi of the Chida, a few hundred years ago. Rav Bar Kochba uh, rewrote, took the handwriting of the past and uh, rewrote his book. Baruch Hashem. So he's a very serious scholar. And uh, of course, we also have our uh, very, very, you know, very dear to us, uh, Rav Eliyahu Ben Chaim just sent us a letter today, Baruch Hashem. Rav Eliyahu Ben Chaim, one of the top Dayanim in America uh, and in the world, just sent us a letter today uh, of support. He's made videos for us in the past and uh, that, that's uh, showing support, but also, again, continue the support uh, by sending us another very lovely letter where just Baruch Hashem, all the... Uh, uh, you know, just uh, stuff that's amazing to hear, amazing to read, uh, even if it's about yourself, to, to see Chachamim, see and review your work, and then support it, is, there's nothing better than that. Now, uh, the last couple is a, uh, they, they're the best of the, of the best in, in anybody's perspective, simply because, uh, not that Chatz Shalom, uh, the, uh, the rabbis are in levels, but in a sense of uh, the, the support, you know, you're always going to have people uh, say, oh, listen, yeah, this one is your friend. That one is somebody that no one knows. That one is this. That one is that. So when you uh, when you get credentials, you also want to have make sure that you have support and you have backings from people that everybody agrees. Now, the uh, top Dayan in the world. Now, there's many Dayanim in the world. In America, I was surprised to recently find out that in America, there's only about 100 or so Dayanim. For the entire American Jewry, which is a, really a disaster, uh, but nonetheless, there is a uh, uh, there's a bigger need for them. But nonetheless, in Eretz Yisrael, there's more than that. But more importantly, there's one Dayan that's the top Dayan in the world, and that Dayan is a Rav Yaakov Zamil. Rav Yaakov Zamil is the top Rabbi in the supreme rabbinical court in Jerusalem. In in Israel, is the top of the top. 
In so many words, there is the, the, the head rabbi of the country, which is Rabbi Tzach Yosef. That's for the uh, Sephardi Jewry, and then you have a Rav uh, 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 Lau for Ashkenazim. But generally speaking, everybody looks at them as, 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 as equals. Everybody will say, this is the head rabbi. That's the head rabbi. But then there's the head dayan. The head dayan is, in essence, number two. Because there isn't a one or two between the other two. There's, don't, there's them, and then there's the number two. Number two, some will even say, same level. Top dayan in the world is Rav Yaakov Zamir. And Rav Yaakov Zamir, for anyone who... Uh, uh, saw the blessing video that we, we publicized recently he is in it but he's not only in it he is made a video of his own and a letter of his own and his letter details every little bit of work Baruch Hashem, that he reviewed that we do and supports it the book the chesed the lectures the musar the irat shamayim and so on and so forth one of the best letters i've, I've ever read about uh, the things that we do and this is again from the top dayan in the world like your local rabbi, whoever he may be, is not bigger than the top dayan in the world. With all due respect to your rabbi, maybe a scholar, maybe a chacham, and so on. Simple. If someone is going to review facts, is a review who, to, who where, where is the uh, more value? They're not going to review your local rabbi from whatever kila you're in versus the top dayan in the world. And Baruch Hashem, top dayan in the world, reviewed everything we do, listed it in the letter, and Baruch Hashem publicly supports it. And there's a Bezalel going to be a video that we'll publish also. But this is wonderful, heartwarming message from one of the top rabbis in the world, one of the top geonim in the world, someone that studies Chavruta with Arab Yitzchak Yosef. Sheikh And of course, everyone that uh, watches my shiurim on a regular basis also saw that the head rabbi, Arab Yitzchak Yosef himself, not only supports, but made a video for us, made a lecture for us, and public support of all of our work, Baruch Hashem. Uh, we're actually in the process of finishing the uh, translation, English subtitles to that uh, lecture, and uh, we'll publicize it. But Arabi Tzach Yosef, Baruch Hashem, publicly supported all of the work that we do, uh, both English, Hebrew, and, and so on. אני מברך, אני מברך את הרבנים, רגע, 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 אני מברך את הרבנים, הרב ירון ראובן, הרב אפרים כחלון, ראשי ארגון בעזרת השם, שערכו בפעליון, שעלו מעל המעלה, יהיה להם ברכה והצלחה, ראש ברוך הוא ימלא בשונות ליבם, לטובה ולברכה, שבכל אשר יפנו, ישכילו ויצליחו, ישכילו עוד לעשות כאלה וכאלה, הדיון תורה לאדירה, אמן ואמן. הוא היהודי הזה, הוא היה מיליונר, סגר את כל הביזנס, אמר אני משקיע פה בעולמה של תורה. איפה הוא גר? בפלורידה. פלורידה, איפה זה פלורידה? באמריקה. כן, ליד. אנחנו שם עכשיו הולכים להקים קהילה ספרדית. חזק אותו בשביל. קהילה ספרדית גדולה. תענו לו מה שבירכתי אותו. כן, קהילה ספרדית גדולה. Hashem, we have a few that are also uh, in the works. The key is, is that when you have one side, you have two, two sides, okay? You have one side and you have the other side. One side has the support of the biggest rabbis in the world. The other side has the support of non-Jews, heretics, and uh, well, that's it. Where are you going to go? Where are you going to go? Surprisingly, Rabotai, some people will still go to the heretical side. Why? Because the uh, Gemara says, Reshaim, even at the gate of Gehenom, will not do tshuva. But the point is, is that, why? Why would anybody support all the work that we do? Why would anybody, you know, write an askama for the book, support the work that we do, with all of the th- wars that we fight, whether it's fighting against different heretical rabbis, or uh, talking about the judgment, Gehenom, and so on and so forth. Why would anybody support all of this zealousness? Well, first and foremost, you see it in the Torah. You see in the Torah, there's a, uh, uh, no, uh, no word that's more common in the Torah, and as far as the, the way to serve Hashem, than Yirat Shemaim, fear of the Almighty. If you compare how many times it mentions 
fear of the Almighty, Yirat Shamayim versus Avat Hashem, it's a factor of more than uh, probably 300 to 1. Meaning for every 300 times, for every one time it says about loving Hashem, you'll probably find somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 times it says to fear Hashem. So you have yourself a pretty significant difference between the two. And that's basically the Torah. But of course, the naysayers, the modernizers, the reformers will tell you, yeah, but this is not mainstream. It doesn't get more mainstream, I will tell you, than the biggest rabbis in the world. If you're not in line with the Da Torah of the biggest rabbis in the world, the head, the top Dayan in the world, the top rabbi in the world, the top Talmidei Chachamim in the world, what stream are you on? Maybe a different religion, perhaps. Maybe a different thought. But it's not the stream of Judaism. And that's one of the things that a person needs to understand. So the question is, what is the stream of Judaism? Why did HaKadosh Baruch Hu allow Pinchas to not only kill Zimri, not only go fight it, but actually not even get punished for it, and in fact get rewarded for it? Because when the Shimon tribe saw their leader, their top guy, their rabbi, Zimri, get murdered, they wanted to kill Pinchas. And when they were told they can't do it, they started saying all types of things. Yeah, nah, he's, uh, he's not even a, you know, he's not even a real Jew. He, his father is a, uh, uh, his grandfather was an idol worshiper. His great-great-grandfather is Yosef Atzadik. And really, you know, Yosef, maybe he did this, maybe he did that. They started saying all types of stupid things in order to justified their heretical thoughts but yet a kadosh baruch Hu says you reshaim need to listen whether you're the reshaim of the time of pinchas or you're the reshaim of today the only reason why you're alive in this world is because of pinchas is because of those people that have been fighting for the torah for generation after generation despite how many heretics will fight against them and how many times they tried to hurt them. Why? Those are the people that HaKadosh Baruch Hu aligns himself with. Not the Rishayim and not the, uh, the uh, innovators, if you will. Now the question is, why would HaKadosh Baruch Hu do this? Where does he say that this is gonna, what he's going to do? Let's see, Rabotai. Let's see. First and foremost, one of the most important topics that we have discussed more often than anything else, is the topic of Yirat Shemaim, the fear of the Almighty. Where is the whole concept of Yirat Shemaim? Where does it even get the name Yirat Shemaim, fear of the Almighty? Where do we get? It means fear of the Almighty, but it literally translates Yirat Shemaim, fear of heaven. Fear of heaven. Where does it come? The Gemara in Masechet Chagiga says that HaKadosh Baruch Hu was alone. And then he minimized himself in order to make room for the universe that he wanted to create and he started with a single dot and he expanded it very similar to the uh big bang but of course the big bang continues to do all types of other things that are against the torah but nonetheless the gemara in masechet chagiga talks about how hashem started the world with a point and then eventually it expanded and expanded and then a kadosh baruch Hu roared at the universe and it stopped it stopped expanding which is contrary to what science says says the universe continues to expand now initially when HaKadosh Baruch Hu created the world Rabotai, the heavens were the, he created the uh, certain things he created water he created fire before he created the earth before he created everything he created these specific things because the uh, the, the sky for example is a combination of fire and water so even though it says that Hashem created uh, the heavens and then he created the uh, water and so on, he actually, these things uh, were created beforehand. It's just that during the, uh, he initially created everything in an instant and then divvied up the positioning of these things uh, over the next uh, six days. But initially the, uh, the heavens was like a liquidy, was uh, something that was not solid. And Hashem roared at it, and it froze. Hence the reason why the outer surface of the universe is all one uh, big uh, block of ice. That is the heavens, if you will. That's the upper heavens. And that, why did it freeze? Because it was afraid of Hashem. 
and from there we get Yirat Shamaim. The Shamaim were afraid. The heavens were afraid of Hashem. That's what Yirat Shamaim means. That's where it originally starts. So when a person has Yirat Shamaim, in essence, is it is coming originally from there, from that original fear, that first fear that was expressed in the uh, in, in the universe. Now, the question is. Can you be a good Jew without Yirat Shemaim? Can you be a good Jew without thinking that Hashem rewards and punishes in this world as well as the next world? Can you be a good Jew while making fun of the whole concept of Gehenna? Can you be a good Jew if you don't believe in Gehenna or you think that Gehenna, uh, the, the punishment is a uh, something that is not eternal, it's just a uh, um, uh, something temporary for maybe a few months, and it's really just a bunch of people making fun of you and embarrassing you. It's not really fire and brimstone and, and so on. Can you? Let's see. Let's see. Now, the Zohar Kadosh in Tikkun Zohar, in Tikkun number 30, Tikkun number 30, Says Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says to his son Elazar, Yesh mi shiare me akadosh baruchu kedesh yechayu et bana vigdar ashro baolam aze. Says there is such a person that has fear of the Almighty, has yirat shemaim, only because he doesn't want Hashem to kill him or his kids, and also he doesn't want to lose his money. But if he loses these things, or these things are not really on the line, he doesn't have fear of the fear of Hashem. This is such a person that does not make fear of the Almighty as the uh, foundation. But if there's someone that fears Hashem, whether in good or bad, this is a person that makes the fear of the Almighty as the uh, most important, fun, most fundamental. There's three stages. There's three stages for the fear of the Almighty. Says there is a fear where he's afraid, whether in good or bad. There's a fear where he's afraid uh, of, of the good, but not necessarily in a time of trouble. And then there's a fear that he doesn't care whether it's good or bad. He doesn't care whether it's good or bad. A tzaddik amul samuta alav leikav ben betov ben adin. Someone that's a completely righteous is fear, has fear of the Almighty, whether it's through good times or judgment. A benoni samuta alav letov Someone that is in the middle has a fear of the Almighty when uh, things are uh, good, not uh, when there is uh, judgment. Rasha doesn't put fear of the Almighty not in good or bad meaning what meaning what what does it mean he doesn't put it good or bad how, how could he do this so this is tikkun number 33 in the uh, in uh, daf ein vav amud bet so then you go to tikkun number 30 tikkun number 30 says says that uh, there is a fear and there's a fear there's a love and there's a love there's a person that's fear of the has the fear of the almighty because he's afraid that he'll lose his money or his, his, his children won't die during his life that if he 
that if it wasn't for the the sake that there's a risk that he'll lose his money or lose his children he wouldn't even be afraid of Hashem and if that wasn't on the line he would in essence pretend like he he loves him this is such a person does not make his uh, fear of the Almighty as the uh, as the most fundamental part of his connection to Hashem. And these types of people that have this type of uh, connection to Hashem, that it's based on, uh, it's only based on uh, him afraid to lose money, him afraid to lose health, uh, him, uh, uh, there's something there. Uh, this, it says, These types of fears are, are considered as if they're uh, the type of connection to Hashem that are dependent on something in order to get something. The, uh, the fear of the Almighty only based on whether you're going to get something, whether you're, uh, is, is like uh, the uh, love that you have uh, for a uh, maidservant. Meaning, it's not, a, it's not a good connection. It's not a good connection. Okay, let's send them. So here we see that there's different levels of fear of the Almighty and so on. Okay. Now, the Zohar, Kadosh, the mystical works, like the naysayers like to say, is that the only place that talks about it? Let's see. Gemara, Masechet Brachot, page 6b. V'amar Rabbi Chelbo Amar Rav Huna. Rabbi Chelbo said the name of Rav Huna. Anyone who fears heaven, his words are heard. He's bringing a pasuk. He's bringing a pasuk from Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. For it is stated, the sum of matter, when all has been heard, fear God. Shlomo HaMelech says that uh, at the end, someone that wants to get himself, uh, every, everyone's uh, report is going to be publicized, everything is going to be heard, all the skeletons that are in your closet will be shown, and so on. That's, in essence, the pshat meaning of that verse. But to say to the saying, yeah, but this also, we learn from there, it says, a kol nishma. What's a kol nishma? Everything is heard. What's everything is heard? Everything is heard based on how much fear of heaven you had. So anyone that has fear of heaven, his words will be heard. Which means that all of the people that do not have fear of heaven, have not, don't have fear of Hashem, they cannot affect people. They cannot affect people in a positive way. They cannot you know, help people change their lives. They can perhaps entertain them. They can make them laugh maybe. They can make them bigger heretics than they already are. They could uh, make them into bigger Rashaim than they are. They could confuse them. They could do a lot of things. But to make them serve Hashem better, never happening. Why? Because if you don't have Yerat Shemayim as a teacher, your words are not going to be heard. Your words are not going to be heard. And then the Gemara continues, same page, 6b in Masechet Brachot. What's meant, what's meant by this, say, uh, this is all of men. This Pasuk, Kizeh Kola Adam. What does it mean? This is this is all of a person, because that's the continuation of that verse. What's the, what does it mean? This is all of man. So Amar Rabbi Lazar, Rabbi Lazar said, the Holy One blessed is he said, Kol Aolam Kulo Nivra Ela Bishvil Ze that the entire world was only created for this person, meaning this person who fears God and keeps His commandments. The whole world is for His sake. So a person that fears Hashem, the entire world continues to exist for his sake. When a person is teaching people to do fear Hashem, when a person is expressing fear of Hashem, when a person is learning fear of Hashem, the world exists for them. Rabbi Abba Bar Ka'ana Amal, the Rabbi Abba Bar Ka'ana says, Shekul, Zeke Neged, Kol Aulam Kulo, this person who fears God, 
and keeps his commandments is equal in importance to the entire world Rabbi Shimon ben Azai says and some say it was also Rabbi Shimon ben Zoma said it that kol haolam kulo lo nivra ela litzvot ze that the uh, phrase is referring to that the entire world was created only to serve as an accompaniment for this person so here we see fear of the almighty is not exactly something that the sages are, don't talk about what else do they say page 16 in Masechet Brachot 16b we have some more how did the sages pray how did the sages pray Rav Rav is uh, one of the great sages in the Gemara and even though he was an Amora many of the other uh, Chachamim say now nah, he was the equivalent of a Tana which is like the unbelievable statement so Rav after his Shmonai prayer after his Amidah prayer he would have a private prayer what was his private prayer may it be your will Hashem our God that you give us long life a life of peace a life of goodness a life of blessing a life of sustenance a life of physical health a life in which there is fear of sin a life in which there is no shame or humiliation a life of wealth and honor a life in which we have the love of Torah and the fear of heaven a life in which you will fulfill for us all of our hearts desires for good so after his Amidah you would have the special prayer interestingly the Chachamim say look at that he says first off that he wants to have fear of sin but then he says again fear of heaven isn't it the same thing no there are different levels of fear of the Almighty different levels of expressing your fear of the Almighty and when a person is afraid of the sin itself sometimes it's only because he's afraid that Hashem will punish him he's afraid that Hashem is going to take his money away he's going to take his life away and so on and so forth so he says please Hashem, give me the fear of sin but also fear of heaven what fear of heaven also because of your the awe of your majesty higher level of, of Yerat Shemaim higher level of Yerat Shemaim similar to how a husband and a wife that respect each other and want to stay married forever have to respect each other have to honor each other have to be patient with each other especially when the woman is pregnant and there's a lot of hormones or if there's medical issues in the family or there's financial issues people that want to stay married and want a solid relationship they have to have respect especially during those times because if there's no respect during those times there's no real relationship and the uh the key is that even sometimes when the other person will make you upset because they're doing something ridiculous or they're saying something ridiculous whatever you still have to always make sure you never cross that line you always respect each other more than anything else it's respect is even more important than love believe it or not because respect is something that if you lose it it's very very hard to gain very very hard to gain and uh love is not necessarily not necessarily so hard to lose respect is very hard to very easy to lose and the point is is that when a person respects the other person even if the other person makes their angry makes them angry they're not gonna go and they uh hit them or, or embarrass them or or say something that is a uh spiteful why because they have respect for that person same concept if you will when it comes to the awe of the almighty is that it's not an it's not a awe because you're afraid he's gonna kill you or he's gonna put you in Gehenna but rather because you have this respect for the for his for his kinghood and again each one of these types of fears has levels of their own but nonetheless each one is even a deeper connection to a Kadosh Baruch Hu himself but here we see that the Chachamim are learning from learning from their uh their uh Rav saying Rav not only do we uh, want to learn from you we want to learn from your prayer how you pray and you pray about fear of the Almighty every day different types of it okay the Gemara continues in Masechet Brachot page 33b in 33b as different sages Amar Rabbi Hanina Rabbi Hanina said Akol bidei shamayim chutz everything is in the hands of heaven except the fear of heaven 
meaning everything that happens in your life or in the world is in the hands of Akadosh Baruch Hu. to such an extent that the Chachamim say that if a leaf a leaf wants to fall off of the tree it has to ask for permission from Hashem needless to say if a building is going to collapse in a a world like we live in here in America not a third world country obviously this has to be signed off by Hashem not anybody else not a construction company not a uh, a, a, a wind everything gets permission from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and in fact the stamp from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. the fact that you're tall short ugly pretty big eyes small eyes half teeth no teeth have money don't have money married single have children don't have children all everything is decided by Hashem the only thing that's not decided by Hashem is whether you will have fear of heaven that is something you have to earn you have to work at it and in fact the Holy Israel uh, Rabbi Israel Misalan says all other fears in the world fear of bugs fear of flying fear of heights claustrophobia and arachnophobia and all types of phobias and all types of fears all of those fears come to a person naturally they're afraid of poverty loneliness uh you know all types of fears the only fear that does not come to a person naturally is the fear of heaven that is something they have to earn they have to work at why if the fear of heaven would have come to you in a natural way there would be no purpose for you to live in this world because you would be a perfect tzaddik a perfect tzaddika so this is the only fear out of all fears that does not come naturally and in fact you have to work at how do you work at it by learning about it and here Rabbi Hanina says that everything in the world is in the hands of HaKadosh Baruch Hu except whether you're gonna have fear of him why because that you have that is your purpose in the world that is your purpose in the world where is he basing it on he bases it on the Torah where on the Torah Moshe Rabbeinu says to Am Yisrael in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 12 Moshe Rabbeinu says and now Israel what does Hashem your God ask of you but merely to fear Hashem your God from there the Chachamim Paskin that the fear of the Almighty is a mitzvah from the Torah it's a Torah obligation not a suggestion what are you going to be afraid of if it's not what HaKadosh Baruch Hu can do to you to your community to your people to your family to, to to everything in this world and the next what else are you going to be afraid of what are you going to be afraid of he doesn't like you that's the silliness of people when they hate the whole concept of fearing Hashem so much that they'll create any type of uh ideology regardless of whether it makes sense or not why because people are easy to confuse but here if you actually learn the Torah you see Moshe Rabbeinu says listen if you have to sum up the whole Torah in a single mitzvah what is Hashem really asking you to do that's what he says to them what does Hashem ask you to do fear him that's it wait a minute but he also asked me to put on tefillin and he asked me to keep Shabbat and he asked me to eat kosher and he asked me to wait for half the month uh, until I'm with my wife and he asked me to uh have uh children or at least try because that's the effort and he asked me not to waste seed and he asked me to watch my eyes and he asked me to uh to uh bathe and not desecrate his name and he asked me to do this and he asked me to do that what do you mean he's only saying fear of him Moshe Rabbeinu says to us all of those mitzvot both the biblical mitzvot and the rabbinical mitzvah they all get summed up into a one mitzvah what's that mitzvah do you fear god or not if you fear god all of the mitzvot become easy all of the mitzvot become easy even when they're hard not that they're easy to do to watch your eyes may not be easy to eat kosher may not be easy for some people to to keep shabbat may not even be easy for some people but it's easy to justify the necessity that i have to do it because i fear god if i don't fear god everything becomes a burden 
everything becomes difficult and in fact eventually becomes unbearable therefore Moshe Rabbeinu says to Am Yisrael what is Hashem asking of you he asks you to fear him and then the Gemara continues is fear of heaven then a small matter as the verse implies that uh, why it's just one small thing one little thing why does Rabbi Chaninai say it in the name of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai that the Holy One blessed CC has nothing in his treasure house other than a store of the merit of fear of heaven as the verse states in a, uh, the book of Isaiah chapter 33 verse 6 that the fear of Hashem that's his treasure if the fear of heaven is the only achievement that Hashem values sufficiently to store it then obviously it's a great matter meaning I mean, say, don't make it seem as if all of the Torah is just one mitzvah where it's a small thing. It's a great thing. Even though it's summed up in one mitzvah, it's a great thing. Why? Because Hashem has one thing in His treasure chest. What is it? The merit of all of those that express fear of Him. That's what's in His treasure chest. He could have said He has refrigerators there. He has uh, the, the, the souls of the tzaddikim there. He has, uh, I don't know, cars. He has diamonds. He could have said anything. Everything is Hashem's. He says, no, no. only thing He has in His treasure chest is fear of the Almighty being expressed by people. That's what he has. That's what HaKadosh Baruch Hu has. Arav Toledano, Allah Shalom, was an Ish Kadosh. The stipler used to send his children, of Kanievsky when he was a kid, he tell him, go look at Arav Toledano, just go look at him. Why just go look at him? Maybe go learn. No, no, go look at him. Why? That's Yirat Shemaim. That's what Yirat Shemaim looks like. So one time, Rav Toledano heard that there was a person that was not keeping Shabbat. Not keeping Shabbat. So what did he do? What does a person that hears another person has to keep Shabbat do? He went to him. Guy was surprised. What do I owe the honor to that I get to be one of the biggest rabbis in the world? To come to my house and Rav Toledano starts talking to him and saying listen I want to talk to you about Shabbat and he starts talking to him and talking to him and talking to him and talking to him he says so what do you think you gonna start keeping Shabbat he says no so he continues talking to him and talking to him and talking to him and talking to him he says so what do you think you're gonna keep Shabbat he says no so Rav Toledano continues talking to him and talking to him he tells him reward punishment death penalty this that the other thing so you ready to keep Shabbat? And the guy still says no. And then Arav Toledano starts crying hysterical and no one can stop him. And the guy starts getting nervous. He says, well, Arav, okay, fine. Well, what, what happened? Why are you crying so much? Why are you crying so much? He says, I'm not crying over you, Arav Toledano says. I'm crying over myself. Why are you crying over yourself, for Arav? He says, because our Chachamim have taught us anyone that has Yirat Shamaim, his words will be heard what I learned today is that I have no Yirat Shamaim because I'm trying to talk to you to get you to keep Shabbat and you won't listen to me so obviously it shows that there's no Yirat Shamaim. I'm living a lie and he starts hysterical crying the guy says oh my gosh for the love I'm sorry I'm sorry no no I'm gonna keep Shabbat if that's the case I'm gonna keep Shabbat it's not about that it's because I have desires it's because of this because of that but no no I'm sorry Rabbi start keeping Shabbat and show that obviously Rav Toledano does have Yirat Shemaim his words were heard but the key Rabbi is that we see the Yirat Shemaim fear of all the Almighty is a big deal is a big deal how much of a big deal is it is it all or nothing Gemara, Masechet Shabbat, page 31b. Starts actually with 31a. The Gemara says, Rabbi Baravuna says, any person who has acquired himself Torah knowledge, but has not acquired himself Yirat Shemaim, fear of the heaven, it's comparable to a treasurer to whom the keys to the inner chambers have been handed. Whereas the keys to the outer chamber were not handed to him. How can such a treasurer possibly gain entrance to the inner chamber? 
Someone that learns Torah needless to say someone that teaches Torah but does not have fear of heaven. The Gemara says this is a complete waste of time. This is a complete waste of life to listen to him, to, to, to be next to him or her or whoever it is. It's a sad scenario to even be him. Why? Because the Torah, that's the treasure. But you're never going to get actual access to the real Torah to real knowledge, to real connection and feeling of what the Torah is. Because you need the keys. You need the keys to that treasure. The key is Yerat Shemayim. Without Yerat Shemayim, you can study until your eyes fall out of your eyes. You're never going to learn Torah in a real way. You're never going to get the feeling of real Torah. Never. That's what the Chachamim is saying. Rabbi Anai continues and he says, Chaval! Chaval, woe unto the person who does not own a courtyard, but he nevertheless makes for himself a gate for the courtyard. He says, what a fool. The person has a gate. He has a gate, but not, the, the gate is to nothing. The gate is to nothing. He got himself the Torah, but he didn't want to get himself Yirat Shemaim. What's the point of the gate? What's the point of the gate? The Admor Mikotsk was an Ishemet, lived about 200 plus years ago. And he was one of these people that, within a matter of seconds, he told you exactly what he thought of you and whether he has any connection to you or not. Because if he didn't, you, were, you could not be part of his Bet Knesset, of his Keila or anything. But of course, every Ishemet will have enemies. And one of these enemies one time in- infiltrated into his, into his Hasidut. And uh, one time, the Admo gave a uh, little bit of wine. A little bit of wine to each one of the Hasidim before prayer. And each drank. Then they prayed, which is not a way that is typical and even a, uh, against the Shulchan Aruch. Not supposed to drink while you're uh, drunk. So from the outside perspective, it looks like there was a problem here. After the prayer was over, that Mo, who never talked to this person before, out of all the Hasidim that are there, points to the traitor, points to the, uh, to the infiltrator, to the guy that's a faker, points at him, says, Achutza, out, you're not one of us. So the guy says, I know I'm not, but how do you know? He says, my Hasidim do not get affected by wine. What do you mean? Everybody drank. No, 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 you're not understanding. My Hasidim, they get the wine, they drink the wine. But the effect of the wine disappears the second we start praying because of their fear of heaven. Once a person has fear of heaven, there is nothing can affect them. I saw you. You were tipsy during the prayer, meaning you have no Yirat Shamaim. You're not part of us. Go. Out. Out. Gemara. Masechet Shabbat, page 63b. Says, start to 63a. Rabbi Shimon Berlaki says, whoever raises a bad dog in his house prevents kindness from coming into his house. As it's stated, whoever keeps a bad dog withholds kindness from his fellow this is a uh job chapter 6 verse 14. for in the greek language Chachamim say they call a dog lamas lamas and rab nachman bar yitzhak said af point menu yirat he also casts off himself fear of heaven so Let's explain this, Gemara. To have a bad dog, you're putting people in danger first and foremost. Putting people in danger, you're not allowed. You could also 
get people not to want to come to your house, which means you're losing out on the mitzvah of having guests. Also, you can cause a pregnant woman to get scared by your dog and, and she could have a uh, miscarriage. But the part that's a uh, confusing at first sight is the Rab Nachman says that if you have a bad dog, you're uh, causing lack of Yirat Shemayim. Lack of Yirat Shemayim. Why? What does that have to do with Yirat Shemayim? What does that have to do with fear of heaven? Uh, the Flame explains that sometimes a person can be sitting in this house, learning, doing, whatever, and all of a sudden the door rings. He's surprised. Oh, no, what happened? Maybe it's tragedy. Maybe it's this. Maybe it's that. He opens the door and he sees his next door neighbor asking for sugar. Oh, no, you scared me. No, no, I need sugar. Okay. A little while later, a few days later, door rings again. Oh, what happened? Is it a tragedy? Someone's calling. Ah, yeah. He finds out. Oh, no, no, I just wanted to cheat. How are you doing? So generally speaking, he's constantly forced to think about Hashem. Help me. I'm in a situation. When he has when he has a bad dog, a scary dog, a vicious dog, no one's gonna come visit him. No one's gonna knock on his door. No one's even wanting to call him. No one nothing. Which means that he starts putting his bitachon that he has the protection of the dog. He has the protection of the dog. So in essence, the dog is causing him to have less yirat shamay. Less yirat shamay. The Gemara in Masechet Nida, page 14a, says that three types of people that are travelers. There's people that are uh, travel by ship, people that travel by camel, and people that travel by donkey. The people that travel by camel, they're all reshaim, the Gemara says. The people that travel by ship, tzadikim. And the people that travel on a donkey, half a tzadikim, half a reshaim. How come? It's people that travel on a camel, they tra- they have nothing on the camel, so their body is against the body of the uh, camel, which leads them to waste seed. Therefore, even though they don't necessarily intend to waste seed, because it shows they have no yirat shamayim, because they know they're going to waste seed, because the body heat to the body heat is going to eventually lead them to waste seed. They show they have no yirat shamayim. The people that are in, traveling by ship, they're tzaddikim. Why? They go into a dangerous trip and they're constantly praying to Hashem to save them. What about the donkey? Donkey, half tzaddikim, half reshaim. If they have yirat shamayim, when they sit on a donkey, they sit on the donkey either with something that is connected, that is between them and a donkey, or they sit like a woman where the legs are on one side. Because that way they know they won't waste seed. Those are the tzaddikim. But if they sit on it just like the camel uh, riders, or they uh, sit on it in a uh, certain position that leads them to constantly get uh, uh, the friction, they're shy. Why? Because they're going to waste seed. So Gma is constantly talking about these types of people having or not having Rachamai. Next. Gemara Masechet Yoma, page 72b. Says Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmani. Says in the name of Rabbi Yonatan. What's the meaning of what's written in the uh, verse in uh, Proverbs chapter seventeen, verse sixteen? Lama zemichir biyad ksi liknot chokma velevayim. Why is there money in the hand of a fool to purchase wisdom, though he lacks a good heart? What's the meaning of this? The meaning is, the Gemara says, Woe unto the enemies of Torah scholars who occupy themselves with the study of Torah, yet they lack fear of heaven. Meaning he's not saying woe unto the people who don't study Torah. It's woe unto the people who are enemies of the Torah scholars. Meaning that the enemy of a Torah scholar could be himself someone that considers himself a scholar, considers himself a rabbi, considers himself knowledgeable, but he's still considered an enemy of the Torah. What is the difference between him being a someone that learns and considered an enemy of the Torah versus someone that learns and is considered a scholar at Talmud Chacham? Says the difference is that the enemy of the Torah 
He lacks fear of heaven. He lacks fear of heaven. And Rabbi Anai, Rabbi Anai says, Woe unto the one who does not own a courtyard but makes a gate for his courtyard, just like the previous Gemara says. He says, Why woe unto him? Why woe unto him? Because it elaborates on it. Rava says, I beg you, do not acquire Gehenom twice. Rava says, it's, it's woe unto him because this person has no Yirat Shamayim. These people that have no Yirat Shamayim, they get Gehenom twice. They get Gehenom twice in this world and the next world. Meaning their life is hell in this world and the eternal world. And the eternal world. Masech Ketubot, page 96a. Rabbi Chia Bar Abba says in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, anyone who prevents his disciples from attending to him, Keilu Monami Meno Chesed, is regarded as if he withholds from him, Kindness. As it's stated by one who withholds kindness from his fellow. And Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak says, he also casts off from his disciple the fear of heaven. As it's stated uh, in the conclusion of the same verse, that he abandons the fear of God. What is this? It says, there is learning from the rabbi, and it is shimush of the rabbi. What's Shimush of the rabbi? Attending to the rabbi, helping the rabbi, helping giving the rabbi a ride, helping the rabbi with certain projects, whatever it is, helping the rabbi. That's called Shimush. And it says, we know that every time in the Torah it adds the word et, eh, which means end, it adds a mitzvah. So, kabet et avicha, be'et imecha, that honor your father and your mother, means that you also have to honor your older brother. When it says, Kabet et Hashem, honor Hashem, well, well, there's nothing, what's more than Hashem? It says, honor your rabbi like you honor Hashem. So, here the Gemara is saying that part of honoring the rabbi is not just learning from him, but also attending to him. Attending. Ki mora rabo, ki mora so it says you have to attend him because you have fear of him, like you have fear of heaven. So you have to attend to this rabbi. But what if the rabbi doesn't want you? What if the rabbi doesn't want you to give him a ride? What if the rabbi doesn't want you to help him with the project? He doesn't feel comfortable. He doesn't want you to do any of these things. He says, no, no. That rabbi is not allowed to not want to. What do you mean he's not allowed to want to? He wants to be alone. Leave me alone. So he's not allowed to not be alone. Why? If he does not allow, he's telling me to attend to him, to, to do shimush. Then he is withholding kindness from him. He's withholding kindness from him because that way he's going to learn what Yirat Shemaim looks like. And then, Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak says, yes, he actually withholds Yirat Shemaim from him. Why do you withhold Yirat Shemaim from him? Because how is he going to learn Yirat Shemaim? He has to learn Yirat Shemaim, not just from the books. He has to see Yirat Shemaim. Who are your rabbis? Did you spend time with them? Did you learn with them? Do you talk to them? Do you, do you, do, what do you do? Oh, you have a rabbi that you met 20 years ago and that's it, that's, that's it, everything you do now is on your own. Habibi, you have a problem. You have a problem. You have a very serious problem. Why? Because if you don't have a rabbi, you have nobody to rub your shoulders with and see whether you're right or wrong. And the rabbi is, if the rabbi is too busy, when he's not busy, when he's not busy, you have to do whatever you can to help your rabbi. Why? That's how you're going to learn Yirat Shemaim, because you're going to see how your rabbi behaves. If your rabbi behaves like a dog, then obviously pick a different rabbi. But if your rabbi acts like a Talmit Chacham, like a Tzadik, then of course you have to do whatever you can to learn what he does. Why? And do the same thing. That's how you learn and you see Yirat Shemaim. Gemara Masechet Nida, page 16b. As you can see, there's countless sources. And believe me, this is not even 1% of 1% of all the sources. There's literally thousands and thousands of sources thousands thousands of sources to discuss Yirat Shemaim well I'm going to talk about one or two more and we're finished it's an important subject enough to extend this you even because I know don't worry I'll answer all your questions after the the Gemara Masechet Nida says that when a seed leaves the male member there's an angel called Laila. And Laila takes the seed, comes to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and says to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, what will be with the seed? Male, female, rich, 
poor, ugly, pretty, children, no children, etc., etc. And Igmar says, everything is decided by HaKadosh Baruch Hu. As HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells Laila, everything that will be in the seed. Except, will this person have Yirat Shemaim? Will he have Yirat Shemaim? That is going to be his only free choice. Expensive, but free. Expensive, but free. Because Yirat Shemaim is the only thing that HaKadosh Baruch Hu does not decide. Does not decide. Everything else he decides. Everything else he decides. The Gemara in Masechet Yevamot, page 62b. Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi says, Kol ha-yodea ve-ishto she'i yirat shamayim ve'eno pokda nekra chote she'neemar ve'adata ki shalom o'alech Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi says, any man who knows that his wife is a God-fearing woman but does not visit her conjugally is called a sinner for it says you will know that your tent is whole and you will visit conjugally your own and you will not sin. Meaning, your Yirat Shamayim is expressed in every action that you do which includes the frequency that you are with your wife, and even more so, whether you're with your wife or not. Why? If a person, the Gemara says, knows that his wife has Yirat Shamayim, and knows that she's not going to try to drag him to the movies, and knows that she's not going to try to waste his time, and make him talk about her girlfriends, and knows that she's not going to try to take him to the mall, but she knows that he knows that she's a tzaddikah, he has to make sure to make the time to be with her. Which means if he has to stop learning Torah, cancel a lecture, cancel all types of things in order to be with his wife, he must do it. Yeah, but she's Yirat Shemayim. Wouldn't she understand that I have a really important shiur, I have a really important chabura, I have a really important... No. She has Yirat Shemayim, but she's also human. Which means... That your Yirat Shamayim needs to be expressed in such a way that you know that you have to follow the Alacha. And the Alacha is that you have to be with your wife. Specific times. That is one of the things that a person has in a, that signs in a Ketubah. In a Ketubah he signs on this. When a person is not having Yirat Shamayim, first and foremost, he doesn't feel like he needs to wait at all. Second of all, he doesn't care whether his wife wants to be or doesn't want to be. Third of all, usually you'll have a wife that will uh, occupy a lot of extra time and waste his time and waste her time and waste life and so on. And in so many words, even the action itself shows the expression of lack of Yirat Shemaim. Which means the Chachamim are telling you that not only is Yirat Shemaim important, but it's literally the foundation of Judaism, where you have to apply it in every single action, including when the lights are off and the door is closed, and you are alone with your spouse. That's how deep Yirat Shemaim goes into. Now, the Midrash Tanchuma in Parashat Lech Lecha, in Siman 12, on a verse 5 in the book of Genesis, says look at the book of genesis parashat lech lecha says avraham avinu went as hashem had spoken to him and lot went with him avraham was 75 years old when he departed from haran and avraham took his wife sarai and lot his brother his brother's son and all their possessions that they had acquired and the souls that they made in Haran. And they left to go to the land of Canaan. So the souls they made. So Rashi says over there, what's the souls they made? Says all of the people that they converted in Haran. 
So the Midrash Tanchuma says, what do you mean they converted? If you're talking about Torah, Torah was not given for many, many more years, hundreds of years later. So converted to what? There wasn't Judaism yet. If you're saying it was in regards to the Brit Milah, Avraham at 75 years old did not even have a Brit Milah yet. So what converted? What converted? How did he convert people if there was no Judaism yet? Here the Midrash Tanchuma says, look no further than Onkilos Agel, the convert. He'll tell you what a conversion is. What's a conversion? What is a conversion? I, Rabbi, I want to convert to Judaism. Okay. You want to convert to Judaism because you like Jews? You like want to convert to Judaism because you like food that's from Israel? You want to convert to Judaism because you like the mitzvot? Why do you want to convert? I want to convert because of X, Y, Z. Okay, so you have to make certain sacrifices. You have to move to the Jewish community. You have to keep mitzvot. You have to keep Shabbat. You have to do this. You have to do that. Oh, listen, Rabbi, that's too much. Can't you just convert me? Can't you just do it over the phone? Oh, Rabbi, listen, maybe I could just go to some other mass conversion like the Christians. Go convert on the beach with a bunch of people and have some, some uh, guy that's a half a Jew take pictures of me and the rest of the girls while we're going into the water as if it's appropriate and put it on the internet can't we just convert that way habibi you don't want to convert you just want to go to the beach you don't want to convert you just want to be part of some club that's not conversion you know what conversion is we're going to find out from Avraham Avinu Avraham Avinu converted all of these neshamot the, the, the Torah says Torah says it Torah says he created all of these souls. What created all these souls? What souls did he create? He made all these souls? Rashi says he converted them. What converted? There's no, there's no Brit Milah yet. There's no Brit Milah. There's no Torah yet that's uh, given to all of Ami said. There's no Judaism yet. There's no Moshe Rabbeinu yet. What converted? He converted the guys. Sarah converted the girls. What converted the Midrash says? Converted, we learned from the convert. Onkelos, Onkelos says Sheibidu Leoraita that Avraham Avinu enforced on them the covenant of Hashem by teaching them about Gehenna, by teaching them about fear of heaven. That's conversion. You want to convert to Judaism? You have to be afraid of Akadosh Baruch Hu. If you're not afraid of Akadosh Baruch Hu, you're still a goy. That's the reality. Why? That's the requirement. More than anything else. You don't have Yirat Shamayim. You don't have Torah. You don't have Judaism. You don't have nothing. And that Rabotai is something that you can only toil over in order to acquire it. You're not going to find it on some beach. You're not going to find it from some heretic. And you're not going to find it just by watching a few videos and hoping for the best. You're going to find it if you toil and toil and toil to fulfill the will of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, whether you like it or you don't like it. And that's why Rabotai Ekarim, Yirat Shamaim, Iot Saro, that's his treasure. You want to convert to be part of the chosen people? Start acting like the chosen people. Not the chosen people that have a few among them that are wicked, but rather the chosen that are spoken about in the prophets spoken about in the five books of Moses spoken about in all the Sifret Sadikim those are the chosen those are the best the teachers the, the righteous that's who we learn from we don't learn from wicked people we learn from Sadikim just like we won't learn anything from a doctor that killed a bunch of people we learn from a doctor that saved people this is why Rabotai all of these rabbis all of these Sadikim the Gdole Ador, Arab Yitzhak Yosef, the Arab Zamir, Arab Gidon Ben Moshe, Arab Eliyahu Ben Chaim, all of the Arab Baghdadi, all of these giants. They say, listen, you're not doing anything special, Rabbi. All you're doing is you're teaching the Torah. Anyone that goes against it, let him go against it. We've had people go against the Torah for generations. 
you are teaching what the torah says we all agree with you we all support you and guess what tell you a secret we've all been doing it for a long time before you even knew about it just like we learned from Moshe Rabbeinu that's the Torah Rabbotai you want to convert you want to be a righteous Jew you have to learn Yirat Shemayim it doesn't come in some cookie it's not something you're gonna find it's something you acquire you work on it and when you do the words that will come from your heart will reach the hearts of others if you don't have it you're simply wasting your life your time and everybody else's Bezat Hashem this will give us at least a little bit of a sense of the significance of Yirat Shemaim. significance of Yirat Shemaim and whether we really want to be Jews like our leaders we want to create a new religion but just call it Judaism because we have a lot of fakes in the world you'll have a lot of Nike shoes but they're not all really Nike they're just sometimes they're made in some you know country and they put the same letters on it just like you'll see some uh, brand name uh, bag that in a store costs three thousand dollars but in the streets cost fifteen dollars they both say Louis Vuitton they both say Gucci but everybody knows one is real one is fake why is one that real one fake one has to go through every detail of the procedure in order to qualify to be real and that costs a lot more the fake one looks the same is named the same but everybody with a little bit of sechel knows it's a fake same thing with Judaism Rabbi you have real Judaism and you have people that call themselves Jews the ones that are teaching what our Gemara says what our Allah says what are every what our sages say that's authentic Judaism anyone that does that will have the support of the biggest and most righteous people on the planet and anyone who doesn't will have the support of all of his uh, uh crocodiles and coyote students and a few of his friends which will abandon them at some point because eventually just like all heretics they eventually turn on each other but just give that time Bezat Hashem, this will give us the chizuk that we all need in order to serve Hashem the way HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants us to serve him from Yirat Shamayim because that is the treasure with that being said I'm going to take a little bit of a drink and you guys can start asking some questions This is a uh, juice, it's not, uh, I think it looks like beer. It's called Excel. They're not paying me anything, it's just a kosher and drink. Um, you have to worry about everything these days, people say things. Okay, let's see, question. question here we go uh if one is doing Q but the receiver does not change their ways does the action still bring Kedusha to the world absolutely uh absolutely the fact that you are trying to help another person that in itself is a mitzvah that in itself is a mitzvah so much so that the Mishnah in Pirkei Avot the Mishnah in Pirkei Avot says that somebody that does a mitzvah gets creates an angel creates an angel that's going to encourage you to even do more mitzvot so surely you get a uh, reward for that and if you really try uh, as, as much as you possibly can a person does not do tshuva uh the person you know sees the truth and still decides to uh, to continue being a, uh, a heretic or against the Torah and so on they lose their olam haba and that olam haba is given to you so it still creates kedusha in the world surely there's even more kedusha if they do tshuva but needless to say the person that tries never loses he just he gains less if you get them to do tshuva 
you get not only the Kedusha that's created from that act, but the Kedusha that's created from all of the acts that follow it, from all the mitzvot this person will ever do. And you get 310 worlds added to your Olam Abba. If they do not do Tshuva, then you still get the Kedusha that's made from that act. There is no other Kedusha that's created thereafter because they're not doing Tshuva, but you get an additional one world because it's their world that you get. So either way, the person that does Kiruv wins, but of course, the goal should always be for the top prize, which is to get people to do Tshuva. You know, when studying Gemara, how much knowledge of the page should one have before you turn to the next one? For instance, should you have enough where if someone else asked you to explain it, you'd be able to? Should you have the key points on the page to, uh, to memory? Uh, that depends what level you're at. That depends what level you're at. If you're brand new to learning Gemara, uh, then you should just you should get the general idea the general idea of what it says not necessarily to the point where you could give a sure about it but just the general understanding of what's being said especially the first time that you go through the shahs uh you have to acquire as much information as possible uh simply because number one you need to fill up this empty vessel that's you to get as much information in there number two you're not going to remember everything that you're reading anyway unless you have a special gift you're not going to remember everything that you read uh, so, but you have to acquire a lot of information. Sometimes there are people that uh, they go with a different shita, uh, where they uh, spend a lot of time on each page until they understand it, and they can literally be reading the same tractate of Gemara for an entire year. That is not the shita of my Rav. That's not the shita of Rav Avadia. That's not the shita of many of Gedolei Israel. Because again, if you learn. By you know by you know getting a general understanding of things at least the first time you go through the shas, then eventually you'll uh, be able to go through it more and more times and uh, be able to uh, acquire even more information and more knowledge uh, that way than you would if you spent all of your time on one tractate. And the reason why is because when you spend all of your time on one tractate and you take too much time uh, reviewing every single detail. You're never going to get to see all of the other perspectives that are mentioned in other uh, other sfarim, other books. So you should get the basic idea of what it's saying. Try to obviously do your best. If you completely are clueless, try reviewing it even again. Uh, if you're still clueless and you've tried, move on to the next page. Sometimes uh, it takes say uh, a few more pages of learning in order to learn what was already said because sometimes the uh, the argument itself is so deep and so uh intense that you have no idea who's right and who's left and and and, and if they're even fighting or they're agreeing and it's confusing at times uh but you understand towards the end and all the pieces start making sense once you see the puzzle a little bit more complete so general thing is is to get as best of an idea as possible as what's being said uh, and then uh, and then move on. Uh, as far as committing things to memory, um, if there are certain things that stand out for you uh, that you want to commit to memory, uh, that uh, whether it's a specific statement that said, or it's a uh, specific teaching or a lesson or something like that, then that I would uh, you know have a uh, highlighter. Or you highlight those points. Perhaps also write those specific points in a notebook. And do the chazara. Uh, when you do the review of what you've learned, uh, you go over those specific points, especially uh, in order to you know have a better chance to commit them to memory. One of the things that's very important is also to review. Review your notes. Review uh, what you've read. Obviously, the review doesn't necessarily need to take as much time as the original time that you've studied it. Uh, but if you look at uh, the different strategies that different chachamim use. Uh, you'll see that some Chachamim literally spent as much time reviewing as they did learning because they review, they viewed the review as if they're learning anew. Uh, and, and, and therefore, like Rav Yashi, for example, his review uh, was learning the whole thing all over again as if he never learned it before. 
But, you know, Rabbi Yashiv uh, he spent all of his days and nights in uh, life learning Torah that perhaps a lot of people uh, do not have the ability to do the same thing. Uh, uh, they're Baal or they're or uh, they don't uh, have the uh, wherewithal to do it, they don't have the tools to do it. The point being is, make the best of your time to do your best and try to consume as much information as possible. Try to write down uh, some key points in a notebook or perhaps in the uh, in the uh, sides of the page everybody has their own uh, strategies uh, you know for example people always ask me when they see uh, you know when I come to lectures they uh, ask me how come uh, you know you have all of these books now many times I'll look at the books uh, when I'm uh, you know I give a lecture but I'm not necessarily reading them I'm just looking at them uh, and, and the reason why is because for me, the way my brain is, is that I look at it, to me, all of the books, it's like a, uh, just a reminder of certain points where I see the page and there are certain things that I have on that page that remind me of certain points. And of course, it's all siyata di shmaya, uh, but I'll have, it's going to be like more like a, like playing music. You play music, there's certain, uh, tunes or tones or whatever it is. And so th- the books to me, I like to bring them or I like to bring a lot of different things because each one is a different note, a different song, a different uh, statement, whatever it is, a reminder, if you will. And of course, sometimes I read like I did today, I read a lot. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, there is a uh, certain uh, things that I'll put on the page, uh, whether it's highlighting things or writing my notes on the page. And sometimes I'll also write in a notebook, sometimes both. Uh, it all depends and sometimes you'll see that my uh, highlights are different colors many times people ask me why do i use different colors of highlighters why isn't everything yellow or blue or whatever it is there's different highlighters if you look at some of my books the way you know whether i reviewed the books you know more extensively is you know if there's highlighting in it if there isn't highlighting in it it's a uh, i didn't review it uh, as extensively if i reviewed it extensively the whole thing is full of highlighters and it looks like some kid went crazy on it because it's different colors. To me, it makes sense. To a different person, it won't make sense. And there isn't necessarily a rhyme or reason for it that I would be able to explain or teach to another student when it comes to the way that I study because this is simply the way my brain works. You know, it's not necessarily the way that somebody else's brain works. Where for me, for one person, it would be, oh, that's two different colors. To me, no, that's two different colors, but that second color means that this is an extra important point or this is something that uh means something specific and so on and so forth so but that's the way that uh my brain works and this the sages in the Gemara many times created acronyms in order to learn specific rules so you'll see in the Gemara you learn the Gemara you see oh to remember this specific rule remember these four letters remember these five letters and so on and each letter stands for a certain uh, statement if you will so everybody has to have uh, you know different uh strategies that are going to help them to remember but more than anything else a person needs to acquire the information bottom line is you know become a bookworm read as much as possible and apply what you read to the best of your ability don't be a bookworm that does not uh fulfill because as we learned today somebody that uh learns torah without having yirat shamayim is uh, somebody that uh it's uh, simply a waste of time uh simply a waste of time that uh so much so that the um chachamim say in the uh uh, uh in the um midrash that a person that uh, has acquired yirat shamayim will be saved in the uh in a time of judgment whereas a person who does not have your mind will be simply destroyed uh they have no uh right to exist if you will in the eternal world so don't just you know eat books and uh say that you read all of these books and in reality you're practicing nothing uh you have to practice as much as possible and uh but again you have to review you have to uh perhaps create or learn certain uh, uh strategies in order to uh be able to commit certain things to memory and uh practice makes perfect practice makes perfect everybody studies a different way some people study when it's completely uh you know there has to be quiet some people study they don't care how much noise there is some people have to study in a specific room or specific this specific that 
when it comes to learning Torah, don't really give yourself too many conditions as far as how you need to study, whether it's quiet or time of the day or uh, certain conditions, because the more you study Torah, the, 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 the more valuable your Torah is going to be, become. And the more valuable your Torah is going to become, the more difficult it will become for you to learn Torah, meaning the Satan will interfere. Will interfere with your learning Torah, which means that at times you'll have uh, all of the things that you can't stand happen to you in order to discourage you from learning Torah. And uh, the Gemara in Masechet Brachot at the end uh, says, in the name of Resh Laki, says that if someone wants to acquire Torah, has to be willing to die for it. Die for it, meaning you have to be able to uh, make all the sacrifices necessary, which include. Uh, everything you could imagine and everything that you can't imagine in order to acquire Torah. So uh, as far as if you really want to um, learn Torah the, the right way, the most valuable uh, lesson that I can tell you is that start getting yourself used to making sacrifices for the Torah. If you're willing to make sacrifices for the Torah, sacrifice your time, sacrifice your uh, your uh, health sacrifice your money sacrifice your uh, uh, you know I don't know whatever you know it's, uh, whatever whatever it is that's valuable to you be willing to sacrifice everything for it if you want to sacrifice everything for it Akadosh Baruch Hu will give it to you uh, because in the end that's really what it comes down to it's, it's simply Akadosh Baruch Hu deciding whether he's going to give you the Torah or not because there's a lot of people that learn Torah but very few that actually know Torah who knows Torah? People that are willing to die for it. People that are willing to die for it. And, um, and that's, that's, in essence, the difference. That's the difference between people that can say different statements from the Torah, can even uh, mention a few sources, but real Torah, real Da Torah, they do not have. They do not have. There are many people that can quote things. There are many people that can say things. But to have the real opinion of the Torah is only uh, in the hands of those that are willing to die for the Torah. Okay, next question. Yosef is asking, why does the Tosefta have details that would change some of the Alachot of the Mishnah? Uh, you have to be a little bit more specific. I have to see what it is. It's, uh, it's very too general uh, for a specific question. Uh, next. Uh, are Jews allowed to pray for the well-being of an idol worshiper? Uh, yeah, technically you're allowed to uh, pray for the well-being of an idol worshiper. Uh, if that idol worshiper is uh, someone that's uh, not necessarily a uh, uh, person that's a machtia rabim that causes the masses to, to, to sin and is a uh, missionary or things like that, if it's uh, just a regular idol worshiper that uh, is simply mistaken, you can pray for them. You can pray for them to, to see the truth. You can pray for them uh, to uh, do tshuva and so on. But if the person is a uh, missionary and so on, then you're, you're going into uh, hot waters. Uh, but also you should know that technically you're allowed to pray for anything. Uh, allowed to pray for anything. And the, the Gemara even says that you should pray for specific things. So much so that if a person uh, sees a sick tree, a sick tree, he should pray for it to recover. You know, sometimes you'll see trees that uh, that um, uh, are dying because bugs are eating their leaves or, or, or they have some type of disease. And the Gemara says that uh, you should uh, pray for them. You should pray for them. I'll tell you, you know, I'll tell you a uh, story uh, that uh, when I first uh, heard this Gemara, I found it very interesting that you should pray for a tree. And uh, I said, but when am I ever going to be able to fulfill this? And uh, needless to say, how am I ever going to be able to see this happen? So anyway, when uh, I read this, and uh, one time we um, uh, went in the backyard with my kids, 
And uh, I saw that one of the trees is uh, it looks terrible. I don't know. All of the leaves had holes in it. Like bugs are eating it up. The tree was like, you know, falling off a little bit. Everything had holes in it. It was, you know, didn't really, really look good. And I said, you know what? Let's pray for the tree. <laughs> so, so I sat there and I read Tehillim. I read Tehillim for the tree. I, don't know, I think I read a couple of Tehillim for it. And that's it. I walked away. I went and continued to play with my kids. Uh, and that's it. Simple, simple. You have to be uh, complete with Hashem. Tamim Tiem Hashem. So that's what happened. So anyway, it's, uh, I don't go to the backyard very often. I don't have that much uh, extra time. But, you know, anyway, one time, uh, I don't know, maybe a month ago, two months ago, I uh, go outside again. And um, I look, I go, I remember, oh, let me go check on this tree. You know, something happened. Is it, uh, so I went, I looked at the tree. You're never going to believe the tree became the healthiest tree in the yard. <laughs> it has all the leaves are completely brand new uh it's like literally it's healthier than the rest of the trees that are there i couldn't believe it it was mamash unbelievable uh so you know the, the, the words of the sages are as real as you make them as real as you make them and if i didn't see with my own eyes it'd be uh very uh hard to believe that something could happen so quickly because we're talking about a matter of like i don't know a month difference or two months difference if that much even and uh and anyway that's that's what happened one time i saw the tree literally was like dying it was uh, every single leaf was like three quarters eaten and it was all types of spider webs on it it looked like a disaster it looked like you know it's the type of tree that you want to just you know remove it and just you know replace it or or completely just eliminate it you know it's just it looked terrible but i remember the gemara says pray for the tree so i prayed for the tree and bo hashem it worked so Maybe you can, if I could pray for a tree and the tree could help, could, could be revived, then surely you can pray for some significant person uh, that's an idol worshiper and uh, maybe they'll do tshuva too. Maybe they'll do tshuva too. Maybe they'll heal also. Uh, Nikolai is asking if a Moabite man can't convert because of denying food and water in the desert. Shouldn't the women of the Moabites not be allowed to convert because of Pashat Balak? where they uh, caused the children of Israel to sin uh, to the point where they almost destroyed all of the Bnei Israel. Uh, yeah, well, the reason why Kadosh Baruch Hu, uh, did not allow the Moabite men to convert is not because of th- them sinning. It's not because of them sinning, but rather because of their nature. Everybody sins. The Jews sin, the non-Jews sin, Everybody sins. Everybody, especially sins of morality, as we've seen in the in the Torah. Uh, Hashem destroyed the world and specific places in the world because of people sinning too much and so on. So that's not necessarily a reason uh, for Hashem not to want someone to to join Am Yisrael because, in essence, he can't really destroy all of the uh, people that are immoral when his own children are sometimes immoral everything has to be uh, you know fair if you will according to the rules of hashem the the one thing that he simply could not stand about the moabite men is that they were uh, unkind they were what's called kfui tova. they were ungrateful people and uh, that is against the nature uh, that he instilled into uh, in, in, into his people and that's in essence shows that their inner nature is evil. Being ungrateful is the opposite of Hashem. It's the opposite of His people. One of the main things that uh, Am Yisrael is, is we're a grateful people. Uh, and we're very generous and so on. So it's a, uh, when, when they express that type of nature, it showed that they would never be able to fit in within, within His chosen people. Uh, the Moabite women did not express this ungratefulness, this uh, lack of gratitude, this... Uh, uh, lack of generosity because they did not come they were not uh, uh, asked for the water uh, by the Jewish women because the Jewish women were you know stayed in the tents they didn't come to the non-Jewish women so they were never tested with this specific thing they uh, they made a sin and you know and they got punished for it but uh, that was a different sin altogether I say when can we start to write the questions Uh, no If someone can't produce an offspring and is sterile, 
is he allowed to waste tea because he, it has no value? I'll ask a more specific question, where if somebody is a, uh, not a sterile, but someone that was uh, uh, born with a uh, defect, a defect, a, uh, so they didn't become sterile, they were always sterile. Or even someone that uh, is a uh, removed, uh, the, uh, the part of his body that uh, can produce, uh, you know, the, uh, the seed that actually produces children. The uh, halacha is still they're not allowed to waste seed, where even though their seed cannot uh, cannot uh, produce children, it is still forbidden for them to waste seed. Still forbidden for them to waste seed according to halacha. Uh, and uh, the Rambam says that uh, someone that wastes seed is the same thing as is considered the same thing as a murderer. The Rambam says this in Yada Chazaka. Uh, I know some people uh, say that he doesn't say it, but that means they haven't read the Rambam. Uh, the Rambam does call it murder, just like the Gemara calls it murder to waste seed. Uh, and uh, there's still a spiritual significance to the seed, and uh, where a person that even if they're sterile, they're not able to uh, create children, they're still not allowed to waste it. Still not allowed to waste it. Uh, now, uh, another specific question came to me uh, a couple of times where somebody that uh, actually um, had a surgery, had a surgery to remove his ability to have children. Uh, and, um, you know, and now he found out that uh, this is forbidden to do such a thing. A Jew is not allowed to do such a surgery. So what does he do? The Psaq al is, we reviewed it, and Rabbi uh, Ephraim reviewed many, many different poskim and could not find a leniency to allow a Jew to stay that way. Meaning that he has to do whatever he can, even if the cost of a lot of money, to undo that surgery. Even if there's a high likelihood that the surgery will not work, that there is no way to undo it, he still has to spend as much money as possible to undo that surgery that made him uh, not able to have children. Every single second, that he is uh, 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 this way under the, his own actions, meaning he's the one that caused himself to become sterile. He's the one because he did a surgery. Every single second that he is uh, alive, he's in essence making a sin. Uh, and he's not allowed to uh, be with his wife. He's not allowed to be with his wife until, uh, until he fixes this. So it's a very, very difficult uh, judgment, but it's 100% truth. It's 100% truth. So... If a person becomes sterile or is born sterile, that's a different story. Uh, he's still not allowed to waste seed, but uh, he's, uh, you know, he has, uh, he's allowed to be with, uh, you know, with his wife and so on. But if, uh, if he did it himself, then he's, uh, every second that he's uh, pretty much alive with this, he's, he's sinning. Just like uh, we were talking about earlier today, where the guy that's not... Uh, uh, willing to be with his wife because he's busy learning or he's busy working and so on and his wife has Yilat Shemaim. Every uh, second he's alive, he's called a Rasha. He's called a uh, wicked. He's called a sinner. He's called a sinner. So uh, there are, uh, there are uh, specific things that the Torah uh, is uh, very, very particular about because uh, of, for the sake of, uh, of Yilat Shemaim, where if, if this is not observed everything else will be destroyed in so many words the, the whole uh, you know the whole concept of Yirat Shamaim it's, it's like a domino effect so when it comes to morality morality is the one distinguishing factor between the Jewish people that are observant and the rest of the world that's the difference between us it's the it's the, the what makes Am Yisrael holy is morality and by morality, I mean the issues of intimacy between man and his wife. That's the, uh, and even he, he and himself, her and herself, and so on. All of that is what makes a person holy. If a person is morally just, uh, and, and they're, they, they make themselves holy, that's a, uh, those are the, uh, the special children of, of Hashem. But people that are uh, not holy, then obviously they need to do tshuva. They need to do tshuva. But uh, that's the biggest difference. Uh, there are many rabbis who unfortunately seem to speak about a Disneyland afterlife like Manus Friedman. Uh, are there any sources for this? Maybe this is a Hasidic thing. No. 
There is no uh, source for this. In fact, the uh, Hasidic world talks about Genom just as much as, uh, as, uh, as uh, the rest of Judaism. In fact, you know what? Let me get you something. You know, since you asked, the Siyat Bishmaya was actually learning a little bit of Tanya uh, yesterday. We're learning a little bit of Tanya yesterday. And I'll read something for you. It doesn't get more Hasidish than the Tanya, right? So you look at um, uh, Tanya Lekutea Amarim. Tanya Lekutea Amarim in uh, chapter 8. The Baal Tanya, this is in essence the foundations, uh, the foundation of Chabad. Okay? Uh, the same type of language is also in uh, Hasidut of Breslev. Same thing is in uh, Baal Shem Tov, the founder of Hasidut. But, you know, let, let's just see. Let's see what the Tanya. The Tanya, for all intents and purposes, is Chabad. You cannot disagree with the Tanya and stay Chabad. For anyone that doesn't uh, understand. Okay, so what does the Tanya say in Likutei Amarim, chapter 8? Uh, let's see. On the other hand, says the Tanya. Oh, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. On the other hand, the evil impulse and the craving force after permissible things to satisfy an appetite is a demon of the Jewish demons, for it can be reverted to holiness, as it explained above. Nevertheless, before it is reverted to holiness, it is a sitra acha and a klipa. And even afterwards, a trace of it remains attached to the body, since from each item of food and drink are immediately formed blood and flesh of his flesh. In so many words, he's, he's talking about how a person when he uh, makes certain sins by uh, by eating certain foods or taking certain actions, this impacts his neshama, his soul, and uh, his, uh, his, uh, his body and so on. So what happens then? That's why the Tanya says, I'm reading you word for word here. I'll even read you the Hebrew too. Tzarich aguf lechibut hakever lenekoto uletaro mitumato shekibel ba'anat olam hazeh v'ta'anugav Mitumat klipat noga v'shedin yehoyadin. Afal pichen, mi shelo nena me'olam hazeh, kol yamav ki rabbenu hakadosh, ve'al dvarim betelim be'eter kegon am ha'aret she'eno yachol ilmod. Tzarich letair nafsho mitumah zo, deklipa zo, al ide gilgula bekaf akela. Kmo she'katuv, bezohar parashat b'shalach daf nun tet. אבל לדיבורים אסורים, כמו ליצנות ולשון הרע, וכיוצא בהן שאין משלוש קליפות הטמעות לגמרי. אין כף הקלע לבדו מועיל לתאר ולהעביר טומאתו מהנפש, רק צריכה לרד לגיהנום. וכן, מי שאפשר לו לעסוק בתורה ועוסק בדברים בטלים, אין כף הקלע לבדו מועיל לנפשו, למרכב ולזקקה רק עונשים חמורים. שמענישים על ביטול תורה בפרטות מלבד עונש הכללי לכל ביטול מחמת עצלות בגיהנום של שלג כמבואר וכן העוסק בחרם אוקיי, so let's read the English already. This is why חסידות לקוטי המרים טניה צ'אפטר 8 This is why the body must undergo Kaf Akela, the purgatory of the grave. In order to cleanse itself and purify itself of its uncleanliness, which it has received from the enjoyment of mundane things and pleasures, which are derived from the uncleanliness of the Klipat Noga and of the Jewish demons. Only one who has derived no enjoyment from this world all of his life, as was the case of our saintly master, Rabbi Yudab uh, 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 Anasi, is spared from this. As So here he's saying, someone that's in essence has these sins on their neshama, has received an uh, enjoyment, 
pleasures and so on that's coming from uh, unclean places unholy places has to remove all of this and part of the way to remove it is going to kafa kela fine so that's is that for big people assume oh this is for big sin that's probably if he violated shabbat he ate pig he did this he did that right okay let's see what else he says as for innocent idle chatter such as in the case of an ignoramus who cannot study Torah here he's not talking about forbidden speech he's talking about permissible speech but it's a waste of words like you're just talking nonsense why you're not such a smart person you can't learn Torah you can't sit there for a few hours and learn Torah that's the reason so what happens with your waste of conversation as for the idle chatter says the balatanya such as in the case of an ignoramus who cannot study he must undergo a cleansing of his soul to rid it of the uncleanliness of the klipa through it being rolled in kafakela as it's stated in the zohar parashat beshalach page 59 but within regards to forbidden speech such as scuffing slander and the like which stem from the three completely unclean klipot kafakela alone does not suffice to cleanse and remove the uncleanliness of the soul and it must descend to gehenom purgatory so too he is able to engage in the torah but occupies himself instead with frivolous things Kafakela cannot itself effectively scour and clean his soul, but severe penalties are meted out for a neglect of the Torah in particular. Part, apart from the general retribution for neglect of a positive commandment through indolence, namely in the purgatory of snow, as explained elsewhere. Here, the Balatanya himself, Chasidut Chabad, says the exact opposite. Of Manis and everybody else out there that talks about Gehenom in a soft, lovey dovey way. I heard some other famous Chabad rabbis that made Gehenom sound like Disneyland. And they call themselves not only Hasidim, they call themselves Hasidei Chabad. Chabad stands for Chokhmah Bina Dat, something they don't possess. Why? Apparently, they didn't read their own Hasidut. Because the Balatanya, early in the book, this is not even like if you read the whole thing and you became like the biggest scholar in the world, you remember it by heart. No, this is the beginning of the book. This is not even like, uh, you know, beginning of the book. Talks about Genom. Talks about for permissible speech that's idle, that's a waste of time. A person has to go to Kafakela. And if he does forbidden speech, Kafakela is not enough. He goes to Kafakela and he goes to gain home but don't worry it's not the hot gain home your your soul is not going to be burned no no you're going to the cold gain home the gain home of snow he even tells you the type of gain home what, what where is the disneyland here doesn't exist why because nobody nobody that's a gadola doll nobody that's a tzaddik made gain home a non-issue a issue that uh is insignificant or is like people talk about it today you're never going to find it in a real book you're never going to find it being stated by a gadol adol genom is very much real it's very much uh, horrible horrific a nightmare and every horrible word you can describe it's not enough and anyone that minimizes it is someone that's going against the words of the sage and our Torah. and unfortunately there are many of them there are many of those people but you're never going to find a source for them never because it doesn't exist and this is from Chabad I had the book on my desk uh scenes here's a question or a curiosity and I'm asking for learning and understanding okay so the curiosity is why only Moshe was ready to accept receive the Torah up there at Mount Sinai while all the people down there below the mountain were not ready to accept uh okay that's why Moshe having no option but to break the Torah tablets okay so uh, two things one 
you should also ask how come it was uh Am Yisrael had to be in Egypt for all those years before Moshe came why couldn't uh, Hashem bring somebody else before him so the answer is is that no one was willing to sacrifice his life in order to save Am Yisrael until Moshe Rabbeinu did no one else was willing to sacrifice their life Moshe Rabbeinu was the first one and the last one that was willing to sacrifice their life for the sake of Am Yisrael at that time uh, and and had the merit uh, because of that had the merit to be the uh, the Mashiach had the merit to be the rabbi of Am Yisrael uh, had to be uh, the one that the Torah is named after five books of Moses had the, the merit to be the one that Hashem spoke to face to face uh, he was willing to die for Am Yisrael as we see you know several times in the Torah where he says to Hashem to uh, to kill him and not to kill Am Yisrael so uh, here we see that Moshe Rabbeinu was willing to do something that other people even if they have a love for Am Yisrael are not willing to do so that's one as far as why he received the Torah the Torah is 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 a uh, compared to water water always goes to the lowest place to the lowest place so if you put water at the top of a hill water will find its way to the bottom of the hill the Torah is the same thing the Torah goes to the most humble people the more humble a person is the higher he is considered in heaven and since Moshe Rabbeinu was the humblest man that ever lived as Hashem quotes himself several times in the Torah that Moshe Rabbeinu was uh, Anav Mikol Adam was the most humblest man that ever lived before him or after him there will never be anyone like him uh, that is as humble as Moshe Rabbeinu where he says we are nothing uh, that is even more humble than Avram, who says that he is dust. Dust is still something, uh, you know. Or like David Melech, who says Ani tolad velo ish. Uh, you know, he is a worm and not even a person. A worm is still something. Moshe Rabbeinu says, uh, you know, we are nothing. We're you know not even anything. So he was the humblest man that ever lived. And the Torah goes. The Gemara says that the Torah goes to the humblest person since he was humbler than everybody else he was the perfect receptacle the perfect vessel for the Torah everyone else although they were slaves although they were hurt although there were a lot of other things they were not humble like Moshe Rabbeinu and therefore did not have the ability to accept the prophecy like Moshe Rabbeinu did as we also saw that Moshe Rabbeinu was able to speak to Hashem face to face meaning speak to him while awake at any moment during the day while Am Yisrael was not even able to hear the voice of Hashem uh, where each time Hashem spoke they all died uh, at, at Mount Sinai so uh, that's uh, they simply their their souls were not pure enough to be able to be that perfect vessel like Moshe Rabbeinu even uh, even uh, Miriam and Aaron and uh, David and, and, and Shlomo and Avraham, Yitzchak and Yaakov and all the other prophets were not like Moshe. That is what makes Moshe the prophet of all prophets. No one ever was and no one ever will be like Moshe Rabbeinu, including the Mashiach. Even the Mashiach will not be like Moshe Rabbeinu. Uh, Moshe Rabbeinu is an exception to all exceptions. He's, uh, he's uh, not something that anyone can be compared to in any aspect. Uh, even wisdom. Everyone says, uh, the Gemara says, I believe it's Masechet Shabbat, that Shlomo Melech is considered the wisest man of all time. Uh, his Gemara says it's true, except if you're comparing him to Moshe. And the Gemara says, yeah, but you can't compare him to Moshe. Moshe is like half angel, half man. He's not even considered like a regular man anymore. It's like, yeah, yeah if you're comparing him to Moshe, then of course he's not the smartest man of all time because Moshe Rabbeinu is the wisest. But if you compare him to the rest of mankind, then yes, yeah, sure. You know. So Moshe Rabbeinu is not even compared to, to anybody else. Uh, he cannot be compared to anybody else that's how humble he was and that's how unique he was and how holy he was and everything else good question um why is history repeat itself again and again means in the case of the Torah is only very little or few are ready to accept while all the rest of the people are complete in denial mode uh as in uh, there's modern times uh, because people are their nature is not is is to be arrogant and not want to learn from their parents from their uh, ancestors from their teachers 
because their arrogance, their pride tells them that they will not make the same mistakes and they'll do it better. So it all comes from the opposite trait of Moshe. Moshe was the humblest man of all time, therefore the most connected to Hashem. The, the most disconnected people from Hashem are people that are the most prideful. Hence the reason why Hashem says uh, him and a, and a prideful person cannot be in the same room. Because the more prideful a person is, the less tolerant they are to the, uh, uh, to the words of Hashem. To the words of Hashem. That's why you'll see that the, uh, 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 there's people like a, um, uh, uh, the Tam Ve'aviram, and uh, the people like Doega Adomi and Achitofel and Yeruvam ben Nevat, all of these people that are mentioned in the Torah, uh, you know, they're all very smart people. They knew a lot of Torah. They they saw miracles and so on. But every single one of them lost Olam Abad. They're all in Genom forever. It wasn't knowledge that they lacked. They all had knowledge and, and a lot of more knowledge than anybody else has in the world today. But rather, they had a def a, a, a flaw. A flaw what was a defect what was what was the defect they were arrogant they were arrogant and therefore they did not want to serve Hashem the way that he wants them to serve him through the rabbi teachings and through the uh, the laws that are instituted sometimes by Hashem sometimes by the uh, the sages and uh, and so on and so forth they were not willing to learn from the mistakes of the previous generation they just wanted to uh, do things uh, better uh, according to them, even though uh, that's, uh, you know, that would lead to their downfall. And that led to the downfall for everybody else to try it beforehand. Everybody that uh, continues that type of pattern has the same exact idea, which is that they will do better than everybody else, and they don't. And they don't. It's a, uh, it's the nature, it's, it all comes from arrogance. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jack's asking, there was a rabbi uh, recently who called it cosmic therapy and you don't burn in hell. Well, one day he's going to see it for himself and, uh, he'll, you know, maybe uh, maybe he'll uh, change his mind. Maybe he'll, uh, maybe he'll change his mind. But uh, as far as uh, what I just read to you and Tanya, you could send it to him. Tanya, Likutel Marim, chapter 8. You know, it's a, the Tanya specifically says, Kafakela, Genom, horrific punishment, and so on and so forth. And that's not the only place. It mentions in other places. I just end up, you know, I just happened to read it last night and I'm telling you that. Anyone also that has uh, um, uh, Meam Loez, if anybody has Meam Loez, Meam Loez uh, is a fantastic series, has a lot of... Uh, um Likutim, different uh, teachings from different sages throughout all of the generations, from the Zohar, from the Gemara, from Chachamim, and so on and so forth. I mean, the uh, the first several books were written by Rav Kuli, Allah Shalom, 300 years ago. He was one of the Gdolei Adol. He would fast from week to week while he was reading, while he was writing this book. And the amount of sources that he quotes and sources uh, is, is unbelievable how he did it without like a whole team of scholars with computers. I mean, he did it at a time there's no computers and there's no teams. And literally the amount of sources that he uses to write uh, uh, the Me'am Lo'ez is unbelievable. But the point is, is that in the first book of Me'am Lo'ez, in uh, pages uh, about 185 to 195, about 10 pages, it goes into the details of the different levels of Genom and the punishments that people get and for what and so on. Obviously, there's many more details aside from this, but this is at least 10, 15 pages of, you know, details of punishment. And Ma'am Loez is considered very basic, standard level Judaism. It's not considered... Uh, uh, you know, uh, like mystical teachings that only the elite can learn. This is stuff that, uh, you know, everybody is, you know, you recommend this to every, you know, yeshiva bachu, every uh, baal tshuva, every uh, convert, everybody. This is a book for everybody. Especially the way that it's written in such a simple, in a, in a very simple way. What's meant, me'am loez is in essence, it's, it's for the whole nation that had a different language. 
that uh, he wrote it specifically in Ladino, so the average person would be able to read it. And in the first book, he has at least 10 pages discussing the details of Genom. You know, so Genom is standard level Judaism, not just the belief that Genom exists. The details of what happens in Genom is standard level Judaism. And people that do not know it in our generation are simply not up to par with what standard level Ju- Judaism is. How can a person obtain salvation, get cleansed of sin, if there is no temple for sacrifice, and at the same time, we cannot complete the whole Torah? German P. I don't know what German P is, but uh, the uh, as far as the uh, cleansing, cleansing is, is uh, doing tshuva. When a person does tshuva, you don't need the uh, temple to do tshuva. To do tshuva, you first and foremost have to stop sinning. That's step number one, stop sinning. Second off is you put a fence to not go back to the sin. Meaning if you are, just like if a person is a uh, recovering alcoholic, he knows that he's never allowed to go to a bar. And he's never allowed to go to a party that has alcohol. And he's never allowed to hang out with people that drink. So that's a fence that he puts for himself in order to stay clean. Same concept with someone that's a former sinner. He cannot go to the places that he used to sin in. He cannot be with the people he would sin with. He has to learn more about what led him to sin. So in essence, he has to put himself a fence for himself to protect him from going back to sin. But that's only after he stopped sinning. If you haven't stopped sinning, then you haven't even begun. So that's step number two is is to put a fence. Third step is to... Have remorse on your sin, meaning the more you learn about what you did, the ramifications of what you did, and the more distant you are from that sin, meaning the longer amount of time it has been since you have last sinned, the more you'll realize how bad it really is. Meaning if you sinned five minutes ago, you probably don't realize how bad it is. If you sinned a day ago, you probably don't realize how, how bad it is. Even if you sinned a week ago or a month ago, you probably don't realize how bad it is because you didn't have enough time to really study enough about the magnitude of the sin and really truly understand the difference between uh, righteousness and the sin. Uh, but after you're, uh, you've stopped sinning for a couple of months, not only will that give you enough time to learn about it, but also to simply distance yourself from that spiritual filth which will allow you to smell that spiritual filth and know its filth and thereby uh be able to be more remorseful about your sins and that's step number three step number four is for hashem to test you again with the same uh sin so if it was with a woman same woman same place and this time you have to pass Uh, you don't bring that test on yourself hashem will bring that test on you and you have to pass the test. Once a person passed that test, he is considered a Baal Tshuva. He's considered a Baal Tshuva. But if a person is not remorseful about his past crimes, if a person has not uh, uh, you know, learned enough about his crimes to even know that there's something wrong with them, and if a person did not even stop the crimes, then obviously he is, there's, there's nothing, uh, nothing has changed. So he, there's not, nothing cleansed here. But if a person has stopped the crimes and is uh, 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 staying away from it and is remorseful over it, that's in essence what uh, Hashem wants from a person, not just during this time, but also that's what they were doing at the temple, at the Bet HaMikdash. It wasn't just about making a sin and then giving a cow. Well, there's a verse in the prophets that says, Hashem says, I don't want your cows. What do you think, I eat them? I don't, I don't need these cows. I don't eat these cows. I don't need these cows. The whole point of the uh, of of the temple is that this was a direct line to Hashem, where you would see open miracles and uh, have a higher level of connection to Hashem. And needless to say, still have to do the tshuva. And part of that tshuva was to bring a sacrifice at the temple, where that sacrifice would be killed instead of the person. But in essence, part of the job would be to show the person that made the sin, the actual slaughter itself. Because that will wake up, wake up a certain part of their uh, heart and show them that it's really supposed to be them that slaughtered that way for the sin that they've made accidentally. And this is the the whole uh, sacrifices that they made at the temple were all for accidental sins, not purposeful sins. Anyone that made purposeful sins will get death penalty. There was no sacrifice for purposeful sins. 
the entire uh, temple was for accidental sins you know the tshuva that we have today is the repentance that we have today is both for accidental and for purposeful sins so the reality is is that a, uh, there is even more possible today and available today and leniency uh, that Hashem gives us today because there's no temple uh, than at the time that we did have a temple because at the time of the temple if a person intentionally desecrated Shabbat there was no sacrifice they would just kill him they would stone him to death throwing him off of a two-story building after that rolling a boulder on top of him and then after that if he's still alive a bunch of people hit him with rocks until he dies that's what would happen if he drove on Shabbat even if he drove to the Beit Knesset on Shabbat they that's what they would do to him it was a purposeful sin only time he, they would not kill him if it was an accidental sin he forgot it Shabbat or things like that but if he intentionally violated Shabbat or any other sin he did intentionally get death penalty the whole uh, temple the whole Bet Migdash was for accidental sins not for intentional sins uh you know so that's that's the thing so main thing is we do tshuva by our actions the second part of uh the replacing of the sacrifice as the prophet says we sacrifice the uh uh we uh, replace the sacrifices with our words what words our words of prayer when you pray from the sidur and uh, the shachrit mincha uh, uh, arvit those are replacement for different sacrifices those are different for different sacrifices so the sacrifice was not by itself at the time of the temple the sacrifices coincided with an actual tshuva of the person so he did tshuva by repenting by stopping the sins like i discussed and he brought a sacrifice today he does tshuva and he prays so it's in essence the same thing now what if he didn't do tshuva if he doesn't do tshuva today then obviously he's still a sinner but what about if he didn't do tshuva back then if he didn't do tshuva back then then the sacrifice is not consumed the sacrifice is not consumed and that koban that sacrifice is called pigul pigul meaning he has bad thoughts in his head he doesn't really uh feel bad about what he did and uh therefore the uh, sacrifice is not accepted it's not accepted and uh this is a uh shown this was part of the miracles that people would see who is legitimately doing tshuva uh, legitimately repenting and who's not and uh if a person was not repentant then uh the the uh the sacrifice would be just simply a waste of money because the the uh the the animal would still be killed but the fire wouldn't consume it it was pigul uh so that's the so today you don't know who's legitimately doing tshuva and who's not because everybody can be a faker but generally speaking you see that over time hashem shows uh, everybody's cards hashem shows everybody's cards uh let's see one or two questions left i'm almost finished i have another shield coming up uh, in hebrew And learning a tractate of Talmud in English alone still considered learning on a high level is it considered the same as learning in Hebrew when it comes to learning Torah the most important part is to understand what you're learning understand what you're learning now when it comes to reading scripture from the uh, Chumash there is a significance there is a significance to learning it in Hebrew but of course you have to understand it but nonetheless even if you don't understand it it still has a spiritual significance but when it comes to the oral Torah such as the Gemara or the Mishnah or Shulchan Aruch there is no significance whatsoever to learning it in a language you don't understand so it is much more important for you to learn it in a language that you understand than to learn it in a uh, and, and uh, read it and not understand anything because the whole point is for you to learn what it says not to uh, learn a language learning a language is secondary the whole oral the whole purpose of the oral Torah is for you as far as the, the, the study of the oral Torah is for you to read it in an understandable way that's why many of the sages wrote their uh, work in different languages for example the part of the Gemara is uh, in Aramaic and there's different forms of Aramaic there's the Aramaic of Jerusalem there's Aramaic of Babel 
and so on and so forth. But you see different parts. The Talmud Bavli, Talmud Yerushalmi have different types of Aramaic. The Zohar has a different type of Aramaic. Why did they use dif- uh, different uh, languages? Because that was the language of the people at that time. So they didn't write this in different languages just because they wanted to show they know a different language. They wrote it for the people to be able to understand it. Same concept goes with the Rambam. The Rambam wrote the Yad in Arabic. Uh, Rabbi Yaakov Kuli wrote uh, Me'am Loez in uh, Ladino. Uh, you know, many Chachamim wrote uh, different works in different languages, in French, in, uh, in, in English, and, and so on. Uh, so why? Because the most important part was to make sure that everybody understands it. Everybody understands it. Now, of course... If someone is studying enough Torah, ultimately it is expected of them to uh, know Sfata Kodesh, the, the holy language, but that's not priority number one. Priority number one is to understand what the Torah says to do and not to do. Uh, that's priority number one. And uh, at some point down the road, a person can learn the holy language too, but that's not even priority number two. There's many, many other priorities before learning the language. So it, just like Mayrav told me, when I first started learning Gemara and so on, he says, learn it in your first language, not in any other language, and don't even waste your time learning the other language, because you're going to learn it over time anyway. The key is to learn what it says in your first language. And we're talking about a Rav, that, uh, you know, my Rav, he completed the, both the Talmud Bavli and the Talmud Yerushalmi twice each, twice each, before he was 20 years old. So it's not someone that's just recommending things out of thin air. You know, Baruch Hashem, my Rav is uh, something out of this world. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a compliment that is uh, coming from, you know, uh, from sages. When they call uh, Rav Ephraim a gaon, uh, a genius, uh, special, and all the letters they write about him that uh, Rav Vadya wrote about him, Rav Yitzhak Yosef, uh, Rav David Yosef, uh, Rav Gidon ben Moshe, and many other Rabbanim that wrote about Rav Ephraim, that he's a Gaon, that he's special. It's not compliments. It's not compliments. It's not like, oh, we like him, so therefore we're going to give him compliments. And that's not it. It's a reality. A reality. I mean, to, for, you know, it's, most people have not completed a Talmud one, one time in their whole life. Oh, Hashem, he's a very special person. And, uh, and, and he is the one that gives me everything, all my guidance on everything. On learning, I learn with the Baruch Hashem every day. And uh, everything that I know, Baruch Hashem, it's a, uh, the, the vast majority is from him, from where I learned from my Rav. That's my Rav. That's, uh, he's my Moshe Rabbeinu. So when he told me, listen, learn Gemara in your first language, it, it wasn't like a question in my mind, no, but maybe I should do this, maybe I should do that. I'm, I'm getting this information from somebody that is an expert in this topic. He learned it, he teaches it, and so on and so forth. So uh, that's the uh, Torah. And of course, he, you know, it's, it's, it's a, I see from my experience, I have many Talmudim now, Baruch Hashem, that uh, follow my teachings. And uh, they, uh, when they start tra- you know, learning the Shas, they ask me which tractate to learn. They learn the tractate, uh, and then they, uh, when before they complete it, I tell them which one to go and, uh, and learn next, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I have a bunch of Talmidim all over the world that learn the Gemara, Baruch Hashem, in Israel, in America, and other places that learn the Gemara, and each time they ask me which one, uh, which tractate to, uh, uh, to learn, and each and every single one of them, I, I you know, I... Uh, I, I tell them which one to learn next and so on and so forth. But also, each time I always remind them to make sure that they learn it in their first language. Learn it in their first language because that's the most important part. Learning it in a language you don't understand is not going to do you any good whatsoever. Uh, it may eventually teach you the language, but you'll still be ignorant about Torah. So learn it in your first language. And therefore, the answer to your question is, if you learn it in your first language, it is actually the highest level. The highest level of Torah. Because if you learn it in a language you don't understand, it's not even Torah. It's nothing. It's, you're just reading, you're just making sounds. You don't understand anything. And unfortunately, this happens a lot. Uh, different people that I've met over the years, where uh, they uh, tell me that they learn Dafyomi or they learn uh, uh, more or less and whatever. And you know, you'll ask them a question about what they learned. They have no idea what you're talking about. No idea what you're talking about. Or they just talk, oh yeah, I just did a siyum on such and such Mashechet. 
and you ask him a question about it and they look at you like you have 15 eyes like you just came from a different plant they have no idea what you're talking about and you're asking them something very basic that you know they, they learned uh you don't expect everybody to know everything but just basic things to at least you know see that the person understands what's going on no idea whatsoever why because they sometimes learn it in a language they don't truly understand and therefore they end up uh, just making a bunch of sounds but nothing going on inside nothing it's just like a uh sometimes you uh you'll have a uh situation where the uh the engine makes a lot of noise but car's not moving anywhere car's not moving anywhere sometimes that's the case you know it's uh it's a uh a gemara says easter uh there's a um the smallest coin makes the most amount of noise inside a pot you take a little coin you throw it in the pot makes a lot of noise sometimes you'll see people that don't really know uh much but they make the most amount of noise uh they they don't even know how to read they don't know how to write they don't know what Allah is they don't know anything but they tell you that uh they don't want to agree with Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai <laughs> and it's usually because those people are learning Torah either by themselves without having any type of guidance whatsoever or they're learning in a foreign language which they don't understand or both or both uh, so my advice to you is that you learn it in your first language the language you understand best and uh and, and that way you'll succeed and also as a side note the Gemara Masechet Shabbat says don't learn two tractates of Gemara at the same time always learn one at a time one at a time and that's why I always tell the boys that uh, go to yeshiva and they learn a Gemara in yeshiva uh when they study at home to uh don't take on a different tractate learn the same tractate you learn in school same thing you learn in school don't take on a different tractate one tractate at a time uh that's what uh rabbi udanasi rabbi akadosh uh taught in, in a uh, mishnah okay rabbi time i'm gonna take one last question Muhammad, uh, let's see Thank you. When someone, God forbid, makes a sin that causes one to lose one's merits, is there any way to regain the previous merits and reconnect at the same point? Yes. If a person does complete tshuva, they go back to a status as if it never happened. And in fact, there is a uh, there is a uh, teaching that uh is it's really something um something really unbelievable because the um the sefer asamak sefer asamak and by uh, rabbi itzhak ben rabbi yosef mikurbil uh in uh, sefer mitzvot katan mitzvah number 53 he's talking about all types of uh, all the mitzvot and in regards to uh, people that are not following the mitzvot and what's the punishment for them and so on but he says a chidush he says a chidush here that's unbelievable where he says praiseworthy is the person who does tshuva because it's not just that he is forgiven for his sins but also his sins get counted as merits and he gets rewarded as if he lived for eternity just doing mitzvot but if he doesn't do tshuva woe to him because he is punished as if he did sins for eternity so here the 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 sefer samak says something unbelievable he says that if a person does tshuva Hashem gives him a reward treats them as if he never sinned before he never sinned before that's how extraordinary somebody's tshuva is so it's not just regaining the previous merits it's literally turning your sins into merits which is like a different world a different world already so and it's as if you only did good your whole life and all of us know we didn't exactly we weren't always uh let's just end the, you know, let's just finish at that point okay so the, the, the Sefer HaSamak says like if you really do tshuva there's like nothing greater than it nothing there's nothing greater than that and that it is written in, in, in the Gemara there's a taught there's a teaching 
Ashaya Bali Chuba, praiseworthy of the Pre Chuba, that even someone that's uh you know uh from their whole life, uh righteous their whole life is not at their level. And the reason why is because the uh, the Baal Chuba has both his a uh his uh merits and his former sins turn into merits because his chuba is, 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 is true and strong and so on. So the point being is is that a person that does serious tshuva is praiseworthy because his mer- is his gain is literally infinite, and foolish is the person who does not do tshuva because his loss is also everything. It's it's complete loss. So bezad Hashem, bezad Hashem, this too will uh, inspire each and every single one of us to do tshuva completely every day, continue working ourselves, and always remember that. That the fear of Hashem, that's his treasure. Why it's his treasure? Because that is the key. That is the key to to his castle that he wants us to go into, where that, that connects us. That's where we go. That's where we meet Hashem. With Yilat Hashem. When we have fear of the Almighty, we're connected to Hashem, we're connected to his Torah, we're connected to everything. So Bezat Hashem, each one of us works on ourselves to gain fear of heaven. And uh, succeeds in it and inspires others to do the same thing. Again, I remember, I remind everybody, please go to the website bhtorah.org to get yourself a box. And then again, it's only for people that are located in the U.S. because uh, it just costs too much money to send uh, one box to Israel. is going to cost one hundred fifty dollars, and the box it's just too expensive. Uh, so uh, if uh, or to different countries, like if you send it to Africa, it costs like three four hundred dollars just to go. So. It's not uh, it's not a good use of capital uh, so try to do your best to give them out right away try to encourage others if you can try to donate also but most importantly do chuba doing chuba is free it's free 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 you can do chuba and Bezat Hashem, we succeed in doing chuba with you Amen.